Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to our October 23rd, 2023 regular board meeting of the East Bend School District Board of School Directors. Uh, thank you all for noting the uh, new start time of just for this evening at 630. I'm glad you're all here. Um, after the we're next to the pledge, after the pledge, I'm going to ask for a moment of silence so that we can honor the memory of Julia Dweck, a gifted support teacher at Willow Lane, Willow Lane uh, Elementary School, who passed away sadly on October 11th. Please rise and pledge allegiance. Oh, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, well, it's my pleasure to do a quick introduction. Uh, we welcome our EHS Student Government Association uh, representatives here to do their monthly report. Uh, this year, we have the honor of welcoming both Jelena, Jelena Patel and Elizabeth Samer. Uh, unfortunately, Jelena is not able to be with us tonight, so we'll give her her grand introduction next month. Uh, but uh, again, we welcome uh, Elizabeth, and I believe Dr. Campbell has some, has some more she'd like to share. Yes, good evening, thank you. Um, we are so very fortunate to have our Student Government Association, our representatives who will be joining us um, at board meetings now for the remainder of the year. Um, tonight, we are very fortunate to have Elizabeth Samer here. In a, and I wanna provide a little bit of background so you get to know her um, in addition to her joining us again on a monthly basis. So in addition to being a member of SGA at Emmaus High School, Elizabeth participates in the Global Citizens Club She's a member of National Honor Society. She's a Hornet Ambassador, a member of Science Olympiad, as well as the PALS Club. She's also a member of our cross country team, the Winter Track Club, and the Spring Track. And so I'm not quite sure how she has time to fit in board meetings, but we're very appreciative of the fact that she's here to share um, an overview of some of what's happening at Emmaus High School. Um, I also want to, while Elizabeth is flying solo tonight, I wanted to just also give a brief uh, bit of background about one of her classmates, Julina Patel, who will also be joining us at future board members. Julina is a vice president of SGA at Emmaus High School. She's on the varsity cheerleading team, and she's involved in Habitat for Humanity, Corral, Acabella, and Horton Ambassadors. She too is a member of the National Honor Society, the Spanish National Honor Society, the Tri-M Music Honor Society. And as a matter of fact, one of the reasons she couldn't be here tonight is because she's auditioning for a select choir group um, out of the district. And so we're very proud of her. And at this point, I'm gonna turn things over to Elizabeth. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so to start off with SGA news, um, homecoming week was a success with lots of school spirit all week long. The pep rally started off with festivities in which students enjoyed crowd activities like tug of war and relay races. Many of the games included students, teachers, and staff. The band, dance team, and cheer team all had great performances. We had about 30 clubs, including several new clubs this year at tailgate. The basketball court was filled with students all having a great time. Even though we made the last minute decision to move the homecoming dance inside rather than on the football field, we got a lot of positive feedback. We had great attendance despite this change and many students enjoyed it more. Students liked the fact that we were not outside in the cold and that they could wear heels. <laughs> Powder Puff was a success and a huge congratulations to the Black Panther team for becoming the 2023 Powder Puff champions. We had three teams compete this year and allowed participation for juniors and seniors. 
some of our high school athletic news. A big congratulations to our girls cross country team for winning EPCs. They had an undefeated record of 16 and 0. The boys team came in third for EPCs and had a 14 and 2 record this year. Both teams will be competing in the district championship race on Wednesday at the sales. Girls tennis had a great season, but came up short in the district 11 tournament quarterfinal, quarterfinal round to Strasbourg. Boys soccer also had a successful season with a 16-0 and one regular season record, league record. Unfortunately, they lost in a close EPC quarterfinal match to Whitehall. Six of their players have been recognized as all EPC players, and they will be playing against Nazareth on Wednesday in districts. Girls soccer lost in EPC semifinals to Parkland last week. Three of their players have been selected to EPC all-conference, and they will be playing freedom on Wednesday in districts. Congratulations to the field hockey team who beat Easton in the EPC championship finals on Saturday. They will be entering districts soon. The football team lost last week's game against Freedom and will be traveling away to Parkland for their final regular season game on Friday. Their current record is five and four and they are sixth in the conference. And lastly, our girls volleyball team lost EPC quarterfinals against Central Catholic last week, but will be playing in the district quarterfinals on Thursday against Southern Lehigh. And in club and organization news. The field study program is in its second year. Currently, there are 20 students in the program with six more joining in the second semester. Of these students, 13 are placed within the East Penn School District, and the other students have partnered with local businesses to learn about their intended field of study, including at Rooted Salon, Cold New Lodge, Remax, Nice and Core, Maple Hills Veterinary Hospital, and, in, and an independent speech pathology clinic. The Coral Department was chosen to perform at a state conference for educators this past week. A congratulations to the EHS academic team for starting off the year with three wins. JV and varsity got wins against Allen and Dara, as well as a varsity win against Becca High. This class scrimmage match can be viewed on channel 39 on December 15th. Interact Club has partnered with Lower Mukunji Township to host a donation drive for deployed troops. This week, a kid to, this week, Kid to Kid Club is celebrating Red Ribbon Week by hosting Spirit Days to bring awareness to drug and violence protection. Pediatric Cancer Club held its annual Gold Out T-shirt fundraiser. This year, the night was in memory of Haley Cook, class of 2024. A moment of silence preceded the game in Haley's memory. The fall play, the Emmaus Theater Department has been rehearsing their fall play, Little Women. Tickets are currently on sale on the EHS website and can also be purchased at the door. The play will be running on November, from November 2nd through November 4th at 7 p.m. at Emmaus' Auditorium. Thank you, and we look forward to a great year. All right, thank you, Ms. Samer, for that very thorough report. Appreciate hearing all about what's going on in the high school, what's going on. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Again, welcome. Look forward to your monthly reports moving forward, and, uh, and then welcoming your colleague, uh, Ms. Patel. Um, Thank you. As I uh, typically do, um, you know, I, I make the invitation that you can stay for the, for the meeting or as long as you wish. But if you have other activities you'd like to pursue for this evening, you're, you're, you're free to go to. You're welcome. Okay, next item on the agenda, our request to address the board. We have two, but before we have those, I want to read the following statement. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with public comments, speakers should feel free to express their opinion, comment, or question, and understand that this is not an interactive engagement with the board or with the administration. Please direct your comments to the chair, be respectful, not engage in profane rhetoric, and be mindful that others, including students, may be listening. I would request that you consider that protocol when making your comments. And the members of the audience, please also be respectful and refrain from speaking during the public comment period. With that, I will now announce each speaker and their topic. When you step up to the podium, you can state your name, and you'll have three minutes within which to speak. I'll give you a 30-second warning. Our first speaker tonight is, uh, is Megan Slivka, here to talk tonight about bullying and harassment.
to be told. Well, it's been a while. My name is Megan Slifka. I am a 25 year member of the community, taxpayer community of East Penn. I want to talk about bullying and harassment and character. Um, the East Penn School Board approved on August 8th of last year a code of conduct for this district. The purpose of the code is to teach responsible behavior, ensure the rights and personal dignity of others, and to help students recognize the impact of their choices on others. So I'm very confused and puzzled. I'm shocked by the irresponsible tactics that are being used in our current East Penn board campaign. I've seen mailers distributed to my mailbox about political action committees from them on behalf of some sitting board members and others seeking election. So I visited the PAC website and found ugly, untrue, and vile and vicious things being said about a group of people who are neighbors and are tax paying East Penn members of our community. This material is produced by some of our sitting board members and candidates and is the opposite of the expectations and responsibilities of your school board approved code of conduct. It says under page three, expectations and responsibilities. We are to teach our children to respect for the law and have respect for all members of the school and community. Why then can I see and receive online and in mail vile, untrue, and horrible printed materials simply for a school board seat? Why are we behaving in opposition to the code? Board members and candidates are supposed to make a positive impact on our district and community and abide by the code that they authored. So I vetted candidates, many candidates, Paul, Angie, Chris, Matt, and Lawrence over the past four months have listened to our community members and our teachers, our students, our parents, and our taxpayers and have spent countless hours focusing on issues specific to East Penn and nothing else. They have strong leadership in the fields of education, finance, and process engineering. Currently, uh, I did some more research. I found out that Paul is the board chair for the Boys and Girls Club of Allentown. Chris serves as Camelot for Children and Hillside School Treasurer. Angie's an educator and advisor in the uh, NGA, NJHS. And Lawrence is a former Eagle Scout who graduated from here. Matt is a six year board leader for a Lutheran summer camp. These are experienced and invested people who've been dedicated a significant part of their lives serving at risk children. So I remain a little confused. One must question the character and integrity, not only of those who create and spread these lies, but those who Thank sit you. silently and allow it to happen. Despite these attacks, these five have held their heads high and have not attacked backwards to them. Thank you for your time. Good evening. Um, our next speaker is uh, Ms. Stephanie Reeves. We're going to talk tonight about the freedom to read. Good evening. My name is Steph Rathis, and I'd like to speak briefly about the freedom to read. As most of us are aware, there has been a great deal of discussion recently regarding books and what is and is not appropriate for students to be reading. I was not aware, and the community is potentially not aware, that East Penn has a policy in place regarding resource materials under Policy 109, which I will get to in a moment. I believe it's important to understand that the First Amendment gives everyone residing in the United States the right to hear all sides of every issue and to make their own judgments about those issues without government interference or limitations. The First Amendment allows individuals to speak, publish, read, and view what they wish, worship as they wish, and associate with whomever they choose. In 1982, the Supreme Court 
held that the right to receive ideas is a necessary predicate to the recipient's meaningful exercise of his own rights of speech, press, and political freedom. That brings us to East Penn's Policy 109, which states, it is the duty of professional staff to provide students with a wide range of materials at varying levels of difficulty with diversity of appeal and the presentation of different points of view. To this end, the board affirms that it is the responsibility of its professional staff to one, provide materials that will enrich and support the curriculum, taking into consideration varied interests, abilities, learning styles, and maturity levels to the students served. Provide materials that will stimulate growth in factual knowledge, literary appreciation, aesthetic values, and societal standards. Provide access to materials on various sides of controversial issues so that young citizens may have an opportunity to develop under guidance the practice of critical analysis and to make informed judgments in their daily lives while ensuring all materials are frequently reviewed for accuracy. Provide materials representative of the many religious, ethnic, and cultural groups and their contributions to the national heritage and the world community. To place principle above personal opinion and reason above prejudice in the selection of materials of the highest quality in order to assure a, a comprehensive collection appropriate to the school community. I am proud to see that the district holds these values, and although some adults in the community may take issue with some of the available reading material, it is up to individual parents to decide which library books they are comfortable with their children checking out. We must remember that not all families have the funds to purchase their own books, and not all children have transportation to a public library. The books in school might be the only access they have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that concludes requests for us to the board. I'll now move on to the next agenda item, which is the approval of minutes for the October 9th, 2023 regular board meeting. I have a motion. Move. Second. Questions or comments from the board? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Mrs. Bowen? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Filetti? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Three times. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Our next is the district update from Dr. Campbell. Thank you. As I reported last meeting, October is National School Principals Month, and so I wanted to um, take a moment to congratulate one of our elementary principals, Mrs. Tez Tara Desiderio. She's the principal at West Coastville Elementary, and just today she was honored by the Pennsylvania Coalition for Parent Involvement, and she received the Paul Rinaldi Principal Award for her outstanding work in leadership in her school community. So congratulations to Mrs. Desiderio. And again, also um, great recognition for all of our school leaders in the district. Um, on October 13th, we, were, um, we had a great evening and our East Penn faculty, hundreds of faculty members and their family joined us for our annual East Penn School District tailgate. It was sponsored by our Education Foundation. And at that particular um, tailgate event, we honored five of our finalists for employee of the year. Those were individuals who had been recognized the year prior as East Penn Pride Award winners. So again, I wanna recognize Stacey Confer, Dave Fritz, Lynn Gitsky, Tammy Keita, and Kevin Romaley. And the employee of the year was announced at the tailgate. Likely you saw that on social media, or hopefully you may have even been there to celebrate Lynn Gitsky, who is a special ed teacher at Emmaus High School. And again, just wanted to congratulate Lynn, as well as all of our finalists for their outstanding dedication and commitment to the East Penn community, and most importantly, to our students. Speaking of the Education Foundation, last week was a busy week for the foundation in that the foundation awarded nine uh, teacher innovation grants throughout the district. So I wanted to take a moment to recognize our innovation grant award winners, Megan Baer, who's a teacher at Jefferson Elementary, 
Alice Bolris at from Lower McCungie Middle School, Carrie Campbell, who um, is a music teacher at Lincoln and Jefferson, Michelle Folks, who teaches at Lower McCungie Middle School, Nicole Gillen is a teacher at Iyer Middle School, John Gunier is a teacher at Albertus, Matt Lobb is a science teacher at Lower McCungie Middle School, Justin Phillips is a teacher of the gifted at Shoemaker and Albertus, and Katie Smith teaches at Lower McCungie Middle School. So those nine individuals received um, approximately $23,000 total in our innovation grant awards to support unique and creative work with their students in the classroom. And finally, I wanted to remind our community of some great upcoming events in East Penn, specifically on Wednesday, November 1st. We will be collaborating with the Crime Victims Council of the Lehigh Valley and offering a information session entitled Trends and Tricks, a Parent's Guide to Media Platform, Cyber Safety and Beyond. Again, that presentation will be held. It's open to all East Penn parents and community members. It's held on Wednesday, November 1st at 7 p.m. at Iyer Middle School. Information is available on our website. I reported last week or last board meeting as well coming up um, next week. Lehigh Career and Technical Institute is holding its annual fall open house for prospective students and families. That's 6 to 8 p.m. at LCTI in Schnecksville. If you've never been to the facility and or if it's been some time, I really encourage families to um, take a moment to enjoy that remarkable facility to which our students have access. So again, it is open to parents as well as students, November 2nd, six to eight. Details again are available on our website. And as we get into the month of November, it's certainly um, theater season, so to speak. And I wanted to again, highlight Emmaus High School is presenting Little Women on November 2nd, 3rd and 4th. The Iyer Theater Company is presenting um, appropriate audience behavior, and this is your brain on social media. That sounds really interesting, and that's going to be November 10th and 11th at Iyer. And then Lower McCungie Middle School is presenting The Champ on November 17th, 18th, and 19th. All details regarding um, tickets and dates and times, again, are listed on our East Penn website. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Are there any comments or questions from the board on your report? Hey, as usual, lots of cool things to look forward to in the coming weeks. I'm oh, sorry. Not really. No, it's okay. <laughs> it wasn't critical, but I did want to just reinforce, thank the Education Foundation for issuing the, the STEAM grants. Um, you know, looking through the just the titles of the different initiatives teachers are coming up with, it just reinforces how innovative our teachers are. And, and really, I'm glad that there's a, a mechanism to reward them and to encourage further innovation in the classroom. So just to thank you to the foundation for continuing to use their resources in that way. Thank you, Dr. Whitney. Sorry, I didn't see you Sorry. flag me down. OK, any other comments? OK, um, the, uh, the next item on the agenda is going to be a presentation on PSD facilities plan. Um, I'm moment to let Dr. Campbell uh, introduce, but I'm just going to tell the board that from what I understand, this presentation does have question breaks, in which case we can ask questions. Uh, but we are encouraged to uh, interrupt with me if we wanted to have something to say. So um, I'm going to relax the, uh, um, uh, the call on rules. So if you have a question, type up during the presentation, please feel free to, to make yourself known and ask a question. When we do get the question breaks, then we'll, we'll revert with the uh, raising your hand. Uh, with that, um, I'll turn things over to, to Dr. Campbell. And, uh, get comfortable. Hey, good evening. We appreciate so many members of the community who are physically here with us this evening, as well as those who potentially are, are um, watching us live. I appreciate that we have big competition tonight in terms of the Phillies playing. So um, I really sincerely appreciate our community members who are so interested that they uh, devoted their evening to spend with us. Um, our team is, is sincerely excited to share with the board and the community a comprehensive overview of a facilities plan for the East Penn School District. The work that we're going to share this evening really includes 
um, a body of work that began about two years ago, and it represents the efforts of many stakeholders. It represents the work of parents, it represents the work of administration, teachers, board members, as well as collaboration with various experts in the area of demographics and enrollment projections, facilities planning and financial planning. As we look at the agenda for tonight, I wanted to just clarify that the purpose of our presentation this evening is informational. Specifically, we're gonna provide an in-depth look at several options to address the short and long-term facility and programmatic needs of the organization. And the options um, have been designed to be just that. They're comprehensive. They're looking at programmatic. We're looking at facility needs at all levels in the organization, elementary, middle, high school. We've divided the presentation into several key areas. You can see we're gonna take a quick look at the background on the facilities plan. We're then going to talk about the enrollment considerations or the enrollment projections. You'll hear specifically from Zach Worthen in just a couple moments. We're then gonna jump into the facilities options with Steve Behrens from Breslin Architects. You'll, we'll go over several financial scenarios that um, really map out options in terms of funding a K-12 facilities plan. Specifically, Ali Mackey from Raymond James will be sharing those plans, and Scott Shearer from PFM is also here as well. And finally, I'll wrap up in terms of looking at the programmatic vision that we've established. And um, you've also noticed that we have some, several members of the East Penn administrative team who are here as well to help support in terms of the question and answer session. You will also notice that throughout the presentation after each key area, we've decided that we're gonna take a little break and we'll take questions at each point in time again after each key section of the presentation, simply because hopefully you can appreciate it is a comprehensive look at a lot of information. As I've said, the goal this evening is informational, so there will not be action taken at tonight's meeting, but we do at the end of the presentation have an outline of potential next steps that the board may wish to take at a future meeting, um, again, based on all the options that we've presented. So I wanna first begin by um, providing background, specifically the timeline of our facilities planning. You, hear, you heard me say that this represents the work that started two years ago, specifically in the fall of 2021, we had a facility study that had been completed by KCBA. And several months later, in March of 2022, KCBA presented their initial findings at a public meeting. This slide summarizes the findings. I'm not gonna go through each and every one of them, but key points that we heard from that initial facility study was um, one of which over our, overall, our existing facilities are in quite good condition. And certainly we recognize that's as a result of um, great work and care by members of our team, as well as facility and capital planning in which we continue to be involved as an organization. Some other findings are that there is overcrowding or we are at capacity at many of our schools. And there was also a desire to take a careful look at some of our learning spaces and, and um, create more modern, perhaps flexible learning spaces. So the focus then, which helps to drive part of um, a, a large part of our work tonight, was to take a look at capacity options for our elementary schools, recognizing that there are some options that then impact how we address capacity needs at our middle schools. And there was also a focus then on expansion of our high school and also taking a careful look at some of our extracurricular and athletic spaces. If we jump back to the timeline then, in spring of 2022, 2022 following the presentation by KCBA, our team engaged in a series of listening sessions with the East Penn community. There were, were several options that were presented anywhere from building new schools to redistricting to renovation. And we wanted to provide the community with an opportunity to really begin to engage a little bit with those findings, to ask us questions and to give us general feedback. 
Following those community listening sessions, we then realized we wanted to hear more specific information from stakeholders. So starting in the fall of 2022, we were very intentional in building facility inquiry meetings. Um, specifically, we had an elementary team, a middle school team, and a high school team. We're very appreciative of the support of our community members who joined us for about six to seven months in which we delved into each of the options that were being considered at elementary, middle, and high school and began to um, fine tune some of those options that were being considered. You likely recall last spring, we issued a district-wide community survey in which we were soliciting feedback from our community regarding some of those options that were still seen as viable options to address the needs of the district. And in just a minute, I'm gonna provide you with an overview of some of those findings from the survey. And then finally, for about the past six months, representatives from each of those facility inquiry teams, in addition to our partner with Breslin Architects and our financial advisors, we've been working to build scenarios or options that we're gonna provide the community with an overview of this evening. So at this point, I wanna just provide an overview of some of the survey results that were shared. The other piece that I wanna point out is all of the work that I've just reviewed that we've completed as a district, specifically all of the timeline that, that I just reviewed, that work is um, archived on our district facility website. And it um, we've provided where appropriate summary of meeting minutes, um, and things like that, and so that the community could follow along and keep track in terms of the progress of our work. So when we take a look at the survey demographics that was administered last spring, we had approximately 1,400 respondents from the school district. If you look, respondents were able to identify with multiple groups. Therefore, if you would add up all of those respondents, it's certainly well over 1,400. You can see, Many of the respondents were parents, guardians of East Penn students, as well as residents of the district. We wanted to know from our community stakeholders their priorities for the East Penn School District, specifically as we begin to look at facilities planning. And the priorities that were the top three priorities, so to speak, that were identified by our respondents were academics, class size, and equitable access to programs and resources. We wanted to call out that there was an other category in which individuals were able to articulate other priorities that weren't necessarily given as choices. Some recurring responses that we just wanted to note are safety, special education, and then social and emotional wellness. We're going to talk tonight about several options that address K-8 to needs in the organization, and one of the models discusses um, a new grade level realignment for us, specifically take moving fifth graders out of the current elementary buildings and having K-4 to elementary buildings, and then a 5-6 building and a 7-8 building. Because that was a new conceptual model, we really wanted to hear feedback from our community in terms of their perceptions about that model. So one of the first questions asks, which solution makes the most sense to you? And you can see there the current grade level configuration, about 40% agreed that that made the most sense. Whereas about 60% believe that a grade level realignment made the most sense to address continued enrollment growth and class sizes. We then also wanted to hear from our stakeholders which of the following was most important regarding our K-8 structure. And you can see there about 62% agreed that equity and educational programming was most important. 23% approximately agreed that equity of facilities was most important. And about 15% agreed that similar, similarly sized schools maintaining the current grade level configuration was most important. We then also wanted to hear feedback, again, wanting to delve more into this um, new instructional model that was being considered as one of the options. So the question was, could a K-4 alignment of grades 
along with a separate 5-6 building and a 7-8 building provide an improved student experience, more so than our current model. Approximately 23% said no, that it wouldn't. Approximately 43% said yes. And approximately 34% said perhaps with more explanation. And that was really important to us. And you're gonna see we've attempted to provide that greater explanation tonight. We strongly recognize um, as we work through a comprehensive facilities plan that the options that are being presented should reflect the priorities of the East Penn School community. And feedback that we just reviewed in our, in our survey, as well as feedback from the facility inquiry teams was very valuable in helping us to identify those priorities of our stakeholders here in East Penn. These four priority areas that are on the slide, you will see that they will continue to serve as a framework as we consider and develop options. And ultimately, we would hope that these priorities should also guide the direction um, that we, the board eventually takes. I just wanna speak briefly to each of the priorities that have been identified. When we talk about opportunities, we always considered the options and wanted to be sure that what we were considering was actually broadening rather than restricting opportunities for students. And as we build out the models or options for you tonight, you'll hear us talk about enhanced opportunities for students. When we think about academics, the options that are will be presented tonight um, are were built with a vision of the programmatic needs at all levels. And so certainly there's attention to the physical structures that are flexible so that we can have large and small group spaces, as well as uh, physical facilities and spaces, spaces that promote collaboration for students, as well as staff members. When we think about finances, and we're talking about a K-12 facilities plan, we recognize that there are some very real constraints. Act one, for example, limits um, what we are able to, the, the extent to which we're able to raise taxes. The other piece is that there's a very practical piece in terms of what the community is willing to take on in terms of financial investments in facilities and how that debt might be phased in over the course of many years in this organization. And final, a final priority that guided our decision-making is equity. And when we think about equity, we're referring to equity in student demographics across the district. We're also talking about equitable access for our students to services, to staff members, to programs, including core programs in each of our buildings, as well as intervention programs. Knowing those priorities, they then became key to helping to guide the options that we're going to review in great detail tonight. And this particular slide you'll notice um, really is going to anchor us throughout the presentation tonight. And I'm gonna spend just a few minutes to go over the K to 12 facilities option. The first piece that I'll notice is we're talking a lot about facilities and buildings, but you'll notice the piece that makes this a comprehensive plan for the organization is at the bottom. We're also taking a look at our capital plan that has already been and continues to be in existence. We're looking at operational costs that had been planned, some potential operational costs that we are projecting we would need in terms of staffing for each of these options to come to fruition. So I'm gonna back up now and specifically take a look at the options um, on this particular slide. At the K to eight level, there are two options that have come forward from um, our facility inquiry teams to be given further consideration. The first option for K to eight is to maintain the existing grade level structure and to redistrict many students throughout the organization K to eight. We would do an addition to several elementary schools, specifically Albertus and Lincoln. 
And we would also do, in addition to Lower McCungie Middle School and some renovations at Iyer Middle School. Option one redistricts many of our middle school students so that we can balance our middle school in terms of size, demographics, and equitable access to programs. The second option for looking at needs at a K to eight level is a grade level realignment in K to eight, specifically moving fifth grades out of the current elementary buildings and making our elementary grade level structure K to four. We would then take the two existing middle school buildings. One of them, you'll hear us talk tonight, hypothetically, it would be Iyer, that would be a five, six building. So all fifth and sixth graders in the district would come together and, and have their program at that building. The other building would be a seven, eight building. You'll see that we would need some renovations and additions at both of the current LMMS and Iyer at that building, at, at those buildings. So again, in terms of options moving ahead to address needs at the K-8 level, there's option one or option two. You heard us at the beginning say that we've taken a comprehensive look at K-12 needs in the organization. And so we recognize that there are needs at the high school as well. So in addition to option one or two, there are several options to address needs at the high school, three of them to be exact. The first option for the high school is to conduct renovations on the current Emmaus High School. The second option for, for the high school level is to redesign and rebuild Emmaus High School on its current site. If you're thinking how in the world is that gonna happen, our architects will get into that. And then the third option would be to design a new Emmaus High School on property that the district owns. Um, and we'll talk specifically about that piece of property. I wanna clarify for option three, whether it's renovate or build, there would still only be one Emmaus High School. So those are the three options that we're really going to investigate from several angles tonight. But before we delve further into those options, I'm now going to invite Zach Worthen from Power School, who's going to provide us with some really essential background in terms of the demographic planning that we've done so that we have a sense in terms of what are the needs of our organization. So at this point, I'm gonna turn things over to Zach. Good evening. Quick mic check. Can you guys hear me in the room there? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking to the East Penn community and board today about the school boundary and scenario planning and demographic update that we're going to be filling you in on. Um, I've actually spoken to the East Penn community once before, about 18 months ago. I presented some of this research um, on an annualized uh, presentation as we talked through your demography. Part of our presentation today, we're going to be walking through background and information about both the demographics and the current boundary conditions around East Penn's uh, elementary and middle schools. And then we'll look at some options to help solve some of those enrollment challenges the superintendent just alluded to. Looking at redistricting and maintaining current grade configurations or realigning those grade configurations to alleviate capacity concerns. Just so you know a bit about us, well, I'm here on behalf of PowerSchool. We are the leading provider of cloud-based software for K-12 education across the country, working with almost 50 million students around the country and hundreds and thousands of districts. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you today on behalf of that, as well as the particular part of the predictive enrollment analytics tool. My name is Zach Worthen. I'm a solutions engineer and uh, one of the lead boundary consultants with this tool. I provided boundary and enrollment analysis to districts around the country, um, as well as working at a variety of different uh, NGOs and government organizations doing financial and policy work. And so it's a pleasure to be here speaking with you today about East Penn's current challenges. As some background, we're going to talk about the uh, current state of both your elementary and middle school boundaries. We see up on the presentation, the current middle elementary school map, and we can see here the boundaries as they currently exist. 
Just a bit of context on the uh, building capacities and alignment. There are four elementary schools, Jefferson, Lincoln, McCungie, and West Coastville, that are currently at functional section capacity. That is to say, there are no additional classrooms for specials or other uh, additional enrollment balancing. Shoemaker, Will and Lane, and Albertus do have some limited capacity, but not a lot. Uh, there are currently approximately six to seven sections of free space across those other three schools. So pretty limited capacity across the elementary schools as they're currently aligned. Given future enrollment growth, district general needs, and student locations, as in where the new students will be coming into the district, we will see the need for between 13 and 25 new classrooms or sections of space across the district. As you can see, given our earlier bullet point, that's as compared to the six to seven sections currently available. Looking to solve those challenges, we're gonna look at several solutions, uh, all of which the superintendent has alluded to, talking about enrollment balancing and redistricting, that is changing the lines of the actual school boundaries. We'll talk a bit about new construction, but I'll certainly leave that primarily to the folks at Breslin as well as new grade alignments or a combination of the above. Again, as an informational picture, we're looking at the boundaries of the current middle school alignments. Uh, the middle school boundaries uh, do present some unique uh, transportation challenges given the non-contiguous nature of the lower Mukunji boundary. And there are some challenges around uh, equality and equity uh, given the somewhat gerrymandered nature of those current boundaries. Enrollment projections do indicate that those buildings do have just about enough capacity for the current, current six through eight enrollment of the district. But there are some concerns around equity and transportation that merit revisiting, as well as the conversations we'll have about grade realignment. We will examine those different solutions to help resolve this, including a full enrollment balancing boundary change, as well as a grade realignment and the conversations about those middle centers for fifth and sixth, as well as seventh and eighth grade students, respectively. We're also going to speak to you today a great deal about enrollment projections and how we come to those particular projections. Right here, we have a, a pretty comprehensive description of the residential research that we do on behalf of East Penn School District. Excuse me. The predictive enrollment analytics team does a great deal of work working with East Penn and all of the districts that we do comprehensive enrollment projections for to help bring residential development research into your district's enrollment projections. What that means is that we actually work with the town planners, the developers, and other people within your community and district to review and understand the scope and size of all new residential development within your community, using things like uh, references, developer fee lists, other sorts of resources we have. We generate a research list that provides a list of all developments that we anticipate coming online over the time frame of our enrollment projections. We drill down to the individual projects to understand the timeline, the type of housing, and any other considerations we might have so that we have a comprehensive understanding of when and exactly where we expect students to be coming into not just the district at large, but particular buildings in specific. We compile all that information, attach a mathematical student generation rate, and feed that into our enrollment projections. So we're not just projecting off of current student enrollment, but actually incorporating information about new residential development. We can actually see here the breakdown of all of those residential development projects, the type of housing and the timelines of their completion um, and occupancy that again, provide us with the ability to understand when and where individual students come into future enrollment projections. We can pause a moment to allow a brief perusal of the information up on the screen. There's obviously a lot of detail here, uh, but just to get an understanding of where and when all of the new housing is coming into East Penn School District. It's a critical piece of the enrollment forecast, but we're gonna speak a great deal about that actual uh, student enrollment forecast. That is gonna be the primary driver of how we understand some of those future state considerations for the different options that we'll be presenting shortly. Just a bit of a methodological understanding, those factors that do influence future enrollment primarily include things like entry grade or kindergarten uh, size, those feed in to the aging of cohorts throughout the system. So those are very tied together. Uh, understanding how that all works within your district, within your area, utilizing the demography and history of your particular district. Again, as we just alluded to, we look at the impact of new residential development as it brings new students who weren't previously enrolled in East Penn into your district, as well as the importance of interdistrict transfers. 
There are also several other important factors that can influence enrollment. Some of those are calculated in different ways, but things including private and charter school enrollment, the activities in the housing market, and as all of us who've lived through the last few years, both in education and elsewhere, understand anomalous events, what we might call black swan events in demographic planning, things like the global pandemic that affected enrollment at East Penn and across the country. As we do look at the actual information that we're going to be presenting today, we are going to talk briefly about some different methodological studies that we provide to the East Penn staff for different purposes. Uh, today, we're primarily going to be using the moderate study. That's our internal terminology. We also frequently refer to them as our facilities projection. We have two studies that we do provide to East Penn staff, the conservative uh, study, which is primarily targeted at budgeting, and the moderate study, which is primarily targeted at facilities utilization. Um, there are some important uh, algorithmic and methodological differences uh, between those two, but basically our analysts take the two most uh, defensible mathematical patterns that they can come up with, and they assign the lower to the conservative and the higher to the moderate, uh, getting an understanding of a confidence interval for those different projections. Again, we apply the moderate or higher one to facilities because we always want to ensure in both short and long-term facilities planning that we're never planning for schools, buildings, or sections that are too small for the students who are going to show up. Similarly, there are some other small differences of the pieces we just referred to, pieces about residential development and district transfers, where we use the lower mathematically defensible line for our conservative and the higher for our moderate. With a brief summary of that methodological information, we are presenting here the enrollment forecast, the moderate enrollment forecast for East Penn. This is the 10-year district-wide by grade by cohort projection. Uh, there's obviously a ton of information up here, and it's not all going to be digestible for every single cohort in the few minutes we have together. But I do primarily want to highlight one major fact. We will see a fairly straight line between 2022 up till 2022-28, where all of a sudden we do see the dramatic effect of the great deal of residential development that is already planned and permitted within the East Penn School District boundaries. We can see the jumps due to that enrollment, uh, sorry, due to that residential development, especially in those later years, as you see the projection of the district jump nearly 8% from 8,021 in 2023 up to almost 8,500 by those out years. Again, there's a ton of information to process here, and I'm sure folks will want to review these slides later on, but I will pause for just a moment to allow people to understand and gather their information before we move on to our redistricting and realignment options. It would it be okay if I asked a question now? Um, I think this is a question about your conservative versus moderate studies, but I'm not really sure. About a year or I, I forget how long ago it was, you said you presented to the board before. Um, when we got uh, the population studies, it seemed from, I'm going from memory, but I thought what we were told was that um, actually our student enrollment outlook was looking pretty steady over the coming years, partially because even though building was going up in our area, people were having fewer babies. Um, did something change between then and now that we're projecting um, a growth of 8% in our schools? Sure. So there's a couple answers to that. The, uh, the largest of them is the macro demographic trends in American education have been less favorable than they have showed up within East Penn over the last few years. So the honest truth is for most districts there who do have residential growth as you do, um, they're seeing a barely that barely counteracting the drop, the loss of students, both after the pandemic and due to that general demographic trend that we have seen across the country. Given the information that we've had from your 21 and 22 uh, enrollment information, which is what we've been using to provide these projections, we are not seeing as dramatic that loss. And again, you know, there's a lot of different factors that do come into that. But generally speaking, we haven't seen as dramatic a loss of students um, a sort of re, uh, re-encapsulation of the losses from COVID as we might have expected and as we've seen in lots of other districts. Okay, I, if I repeat back to you what I think you told me, um, in other places of the country, uh, people are having fewer babies, but that's not happening here in East Penn. Is that basically what you're saying? 
that that's not precisely what I'm saying, although it's a fair it's a fair uh, straight line conclusion. What I'm saying is that the students are not the students are showing up in your schools more than they are in some of the other national trend line districts that we've seen. Again, comments about birth rates at this point, especially as they affect COVID, we're, we're not at the point where COVID children have entered, COVID babies have entered public elementary schools yet. Um, but in terms of students returning to those classrooms, in terms of their residence as opposed to their birth, yes, that is a true statement. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If I could, can I yeah. jump in? So uh, a question about private charter school enrollment, um, and I guess related uh, inter-district or transfers into the district and I guess out of the district. Are you uh, using, I mean, obviously there's really no way to know um, what the future holds for such things. So what are you using in terms of the numbers or the projections for um, students leaving the public schools in the district, going to private charter schools or going to other districts and vice versa? Sure, so that actually touches on what we just referenced, which is that again, we're not really talking about birth rates even yet in your, in your cohorts from the big losses that we saw around the COVID pandemic, around other changes in public education. You know, when we're, as your demographer of record, we are only forecasting uh, your student body, right? We're not forecasting for the loss of other students by a single student count. Um, so what we see is the trends as they show up or don't show up as compared to the census data that we have on your community at large, right? So we can see the students as they, uh, as they show up in the community at large, and we can see the absence of them where they're not showing up from your uh, audited enrollment register. So in terms of that predictive question, again, one of the reasons that a lot of districts have seen a fairly uh, steep decline in enrollment projections over the last two or three years is a spike in attendance at both charters and at parochial or other private school options. Um, again, just given the trend lines that we have seen, while we're not obviously forecasting individual student decisions for those students who elect to attend other educational options, we are seeing them, in essence, not leaving the East Penn um, student body. And again, providing their information based on their presence or absence within the student body. Again, we're not, I'm not obviously personally surveying those students in terms of the decision-making process, but we can see the evidence of their decisions in how the student body trend lines are showing up. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying. Absolutely. One more, Mr. Bird. Yes, I have a question. I guess you talked about some of the things that uh, drive your enrollment data. What about the uh, house resales? And as the trend goes, that we have older uh, occupants in our district and they sell their houses or move out, and we have people moving in and out. I think you talked a little bit about that. But what do you use for that? Uh, how does that reflect the information that you came up with? Yeah, yeah, generally speaking, again, you know, when we're talking about new housing, obviously, those are pieces, those are exogenous events, so they're not going to be present in your student body forecasting. House turnover is, generally speaking, a piece that is going to show itself in the trend lines, especially of those entry cohorts. So when you're talking about things like a district like East Penn, you're going to see those students show up or not in those entry grades uh, with the resale or lack thereof of their houses because Again, this is really sort of one of those third factors. It's a macro demographic factor across the country. As we look at the uh, drop in overall public education rates across the country, one of those major factors is frankly that young families have less opportunity to purchase houses in school districts than they ever have before. This is an Anise Penn issue. This is a national housing market issue. Um, so generally speaking, we are not looking at the housing market as a truly independent factor outside of events like 2008, where uh, what was then Decision Insight, what's now Predictive Enrollment Analytics, did in essence modify our own mathematical algorithms across the country to reflect the lack of those entry grade students because families couldn't afford the houses. Again, because we're talking about students who are showing up in current housing stock that may already have East Penn students, we're actually going to see that as an endogenous factor in the trend lines of those students at the entry grades through the historical work that we're doing with your district's historical enrollment information. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's it for now. Well, with that great introduction on the district's current enrollment standing, uh, we'll take a look at our new options that we're presenting today. Uh, again, just as a bit of information, everything that we're looking at here today utilizes those enrollment projections we just looked at to establish mathematical viability for each and every option that we're presenting. Option one that we are talking about today is redistricting and maintaining the current grade configurations, that is to say K-5 and 6-8 for the elementary and middle schools respectively. 
This would rely on the expansion of the Albertus and Lincoln campuses by approximately seven classrooms each. And following those renovations, East Penn would redistrict all nine elementary and middle schools for balancing and space utilization. Uh, this plan would affect about 300 or 298 elementary students at last count and approximately 986 through eight students. That additional space at Albertus and Lincoln elementaries would solve acute challenges at Albertus and Lincoln, as well as provide Jefferson, West Coastville, and Mukunji with space to immediately solve theirs. And Shoemaker and Willow Lane would be able to absorb some other portions of the boundary to allow for balance and long-term facility planning, especially around things like special classroom utilization. The middle schools, as we said earlier, do retain just enough space as we look forward for these six, eight populations that currently exist. But that gerrymandered boundary does create some challenges around equity and transportation. And here we're looking at a redivided boundary to address both of those concerns. As we move on to the specific data about those, we can look at slightly larger maps, providing some clarity on each of those. And again, while I'm not going to read through every piece of data up on the board, we can see some brief uh, important pieces of information, again, especially focusing on sensible and aligned capacity utilization at all buildings in both uh, the current year, if we did the realignment, and in the future as the district begins to wrestle with that new uh, enrollment from residential development. And again, just to highlight, approximately 300 students would be redistricted in this particular alignment and would provide them with those new schools. At the middle school level, again, what we're looking at here is taking that slightly uh, odd looking gerrymandered boundary and splitting the district essentially in half between Lower Mukunji and Iyer. Again, there is an approximate uh, correct amount of capacity at these buildings for the enrollment as currently had but a fairly unequal free and reduced rate, as well as that uh, unique transportation challenge given that boundary. And what we can see here is again, a focus on appropriate and equal capacity utilization and free and reduced rates across the district. Again, given the size and scope of that redistricting, we do see about 980 students being affected at that level. The other option the superintendent spoke about is a realignment of grade levels. So what we're looking at here is taking our K-4 students and keeping them in the elementary schools and opening two middle centers, one for fifth and sixth graders, one for seventh and eighth graders. The current capacity of Lower Mukunji and Iyer combined is not 2,400 students, it's about 2,000 students. So building expansions at the elementaries would be needed to expand capacity by about 400 students or approximately 16 to 20 classrooms. Those middle centers would address the same unequal free and reduced rates as the redistricting, as all middle schools would share a district-wide boundary, much like the high school. All elementaries would then be converted to the K-4 schools, which would solve acute capacity concerns at Jefferson, Lincoln, McCungy, and West Coastville. There would still need to be a boundary realignment to ensure that long-term balancing and equal utilization of those buildings was achieved as we went through this process. Again, as we look at the data here, we can see the realignment of the grade information. We can see that we would affect about 340 K-4 elementary students through this alignment change and all 2,515 students uh, at the five through eight grade band. While it is true that there will be some seventh and eighth grade students who would remain at their same elementary school, the systematic change of those alignments pretty fairly implies that all students will see some effect. Again, we're not going to highlight every piece other than to say that this plan uh, focused on an equal and uh, equitable capacity utilization and does highlight in the bottom right corner, we can see the need for the expansion at the middle grades levels to ensure that we have capacity for the 2400 fifth through eighth students in East Penn School District. With that, I will hand the uh, the mic back to the folks in the room for any questions. And as, as always, and as usual, it's been a pleasure speaking to the East Penn board and community today. Hey, thank you, Mr. Werther. Absolutely. Mr. Bird, I just have a question. You talked about uh, equity and some gerrymandering and the boundaries of middle school. Did you expound on that? What does that mean? And uh, what is that? why is that important? So, so I can certainly speak to a portion of it, which is the uh, piece we used as a byword to try to address some of those concerns. Um, and then I may hand it back to folks in the room for some of those district policy questions. When we spoke uh, in these scenarios about equity, uh, the primary piece we were using today was using free and reduced lunch rates as a uh, byword for 
uh, equitable utilization of resources at the schools because of the way that the higher and lower Makunji boundaries were drawn. They were pulling uh, students from very uh, disparate socioeconomic areas of the district in ways that concentrated free and reduced lunch rates at one um, at one of the middle schools. So one of the things we looked at when drawing those was try to uh, make sure that each of the schools we were drawing from was creating a balance of socioeconomics in the neighborhoods that were being drawn from. Now, I certainly want to, above the board, say equity and equality is not what I'm uh, primarily on board for. I'm obviously looking only at the demography of the district, and there's certainly lots of ways to address and look at those questions. Um, and so with an understanding of the demographic information we used, I'll, I'll hand it back to the East Penn staff in the room to address any thoughts they have about the utilization of that number and, and how we went about that process. Uh, the only thing that I would add to that is just that I don't, the, the term gerrymandering, I think like de facto, not an intentional, like as, as um, in the history of East Penn, as different developments were added, that those developments were then focused at Lower Mukunji. So when you look at the map, it's just a result of the district growing and I are maintaining its original boundary and the others being assigned to Lower Mukunji when Lower Mukunji, at the time of construction. Thank you. Yes, um, actually, this is a question for the administration on behalf of some of the audience members that I saw feverishly trying to take photos of the slides. Um, could you just allow the audience and anybody watching this on video when this presentation will be available? Maybe it is available now. I'm, I'm signed in, so I'm not sure if it's available on board docs for everybody else or not. The presentation will be made available tomorrow morning. Um, it's it would as is our typical process when the video, the recording is also posted. Okay, and and so people can find it in board docs. That's where they would look for it. Yes. Okay. Um, so the board docs presentation from this meeting will have this slide deck on it. I just, I I just blowing zooming up a tiny photo of statistics can't be fun. So anyway, I just wanted to mention that. Um, the question that I actually have though is something that just went by quickly and I wanna make sure I understood it. Um, the realignment plan would also include some redistricting, is that correct? To make sure that the schools are balanced? That's correct, right. yes. So the K-4 realignment plan, which would turn all East Penn elementaries into K-4 alignment would solve the acute enrollment challenges at several of those schools. So in 2024, 2025, if those schools, you know, a flip was switched, there would be no acute enrollment concerns there. Given where the location of that residential development is causing stress, particularly on the Albertus building, there would still be an eventual amount of growth within at least Albertus and potentially several other schools that would require and necessitate enrollment boundary redistricting anyways, even at the K-4 alignment. And so taking the opportunity to redraw the boundaries in um, in alignment with those 10-year enrollment projections was thought to be the best synthesis of those two um, of, of that of that path forward. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, this last question, maybe it should come later in the presentation, and if so, just say so. Um, it's clear to me how the realignment issue solves some of your lack of equity at the two middle schools. If we redistrict if we go with that option does that solve the problem of having most of our special ed students at ire as a um or do you um like for example some families who are actually districts to go into lmms or are, are sent to ire instead for special ed reasons and i'm not sure if they're siblings are allowed to go with them or not. I, I can't remember what the policy is on that, but does that solve that issue so that it's it's more spread out evenly between the schools or is the even distribution only happening if we do the realignment? Can we hold that question for when we take a look at the program later in the okay. presentation? All right, thank you. And, and the only thing so I will, oh yeah, the only thing I will add is that the numbers we were looking at were neighborhood students of assignment, okay. just to be clear on what the numbers and identification of those students were. Thank you. 
Absolutely. I also had a reflection um, that I wanted to share just based on Ms. Bowman's question about the presentation and, and, and many of the data slides I can appreciate from an audience perspective uh, that it can be very difficult to read some of the data points from your seat. And so um, really this presentation is one that I think overall is best digested when you have an opportunity to pull up the presentations and perhaps really zoom in on the specific data that you might be interested in analyzing. Our goal this evening was conceptually, you know, when we take a look at enrollment tables, you're going to see in particular when we take a look at financial scenarios, the individual cells can be very, very difficult to read. And so that's why we're speaking conceptually to that information tonight. Oh, Mr. Champagne. Just uh, one quick question for uh, Zach. So you, you mentioned that this forecast is tied around 2028. What would cause it to accelerate and we would see growth quicker? And what would cause it to slip? So let's say we don't see growth until 2029 or 2030. Mm -hmm. I'm primarily interested in understanding, you know, how confident you are in these projections based on what you've been able to get from the information that's provided in the local communities and so forth, and that how concrete you believe the forecast for some of these housing units are given current interest rates and in market trends. Yeah, absolutely. So th there's a lot to unpack there. I'll try to address it as best I can. Um, in terms of those projections raising, in terms of us undershooting the mark, uh, there's a, I think there's very little chance of that. That's why we uh, do use this moderate projection, you know, the, the more aggressive projection with these facilities planning, because we certainly want to allay exactly that concern. And the reason we're fairly confident in that is when we talk about our new residential development, we are using all uh, permanent and approved housing. So given the nature of the current housing market, I, I'm not a housing market prognosticator alone, but what I would say is I don't think anybody, including, you know, eminences like the Fed, expect a boom in the housing market of new construction. So what we're looking at feels like a very safe, logical upper bound of any housing that is likely to be permitted and coming into construction over that timeline. Now, obviously, when we talk about an eight, 10 year timeline, we certainly can't forecast for the possibility of a seismic change in the housing market six, eight, or 10 years down the line. Now, I will say your district does not have a massive amount of area, physical area, I should say, like that plant space for massive new developments. We're probably not looking at the, you know, two, three, five thousand family suburban developments that can completely change the makeup of a district. So in terms of that upper bound, again, there's a lot of information and we can um, share with, with Assistant uh, Superintendent Povolitis some of that historical information we've shared as your demographer, some of the study information and the final reports that drive that. In terms of the lower end, um, you know, there certainly are, again, changes to that, that, that can exist in terms of that permitting. As I said earlier, we're using permitted and approved projects. So we certainly expect them to come into practice. Now, things like the 2008 uh, housing market crash certainly affected what were already considered shovel-ready ready projects. To be completely frank, there's not a lot of way to account for a change in the housing market that national and seismic, but we do use those fully vetted, permitted approved projects as they're already coming on. The final piece I will say is we did talk about some study differences between our moderate and our conservative studies. The biggest difference in those in housing is not whether they're going to be built, but their occupancy timelines. So we do provide the district with a conservative occupancy timeline where we do anticipate that all units that we're reporting will be constructed, but we do use a much more conservative approach to understanding when we believe they will be occupied by families that may enter East Penn School District. Again, because we're talking about a facilities consideration and want to ensure that we have the space for the potential new students arriving in your district. We do use that moderate, but as we talk through some other considerations with uh, district staff and do have some conversations around things like budgeting, we do occasionally utilize that more conservative approach to occupancy as we look at the possibility of a weak housing market affecting not necessarily construction and permitting, but occupancy of those buildings. And Mr. Champagne, I can add a little bit to that. I, we work very closely with uh, Zach's colleagues on the research part of it. 
and they they specifically reach out to our municipalities. Florida Country Township is, of course, one that we spend a lot of time with because that's where a lot of the proposed development is uh, is located and planned for. Um, during that work, uh, Power School specifically speaks with them, looks at when do they expect to break ground, uh, what permissions are in, what's the timeline looking like, and so you know I'll use the the words. Um, that that Lumber Country Township planners used, you know, we don't have a crystal ball exactly to determine, but we know kind of once once um, approvals um, have been made um, and progress has been made, we get have a, an estimated timeline as to where how many uh, developments and units will go in. It gets much more difficult as as Zach talked about the confidence in that as you get further out, we don't know each year. Um, you know, of course, we continue to look at it as he had explained earlier during the research phase of that. And then we make adjustments if needed. If there's a delay, uh, it could move some developments, uh, you know, slide them from year to year. Uh, but overall, we're confident in developments based on the information received from our municipalities and um, the approvals that they received, they, they provided for um, the, the growing developments and the approval of those. Well, that's fine. I guess I'm trying to understand though, is if you use the conservative forecast, just as an example, would you see a one-year slip in how this growth in the district would occur? Would you see a two-year slip? Because I'm just trying to figure out is there, what's the confidence interval? What, what confidence do you have around this kind of, you're putting a stake in the ground around 2028 and we're planning accordingly. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying, I'm trying to understand how confident we are in that 2028 kind of stake in the ground. Again, that slippage is going to be largely dependent on, I mean, it's going to be dependent on a few things, including some of those factors that we already looked at, so the size of the unit and the type of housing that that unit is, and those combined market factors indicating that. So it's not a simple answer of, uh, it's not a precise answer to say that that slippage is one year or another at different districts. When we look at East Penn specifically, we can certainly uh, share back through uh, East Penn staff what that conservative residential research piece looks like. Again, to be clear, it doesn't actually change the overall assumption of the students gained district-wide. It's the same student generation rate. It's just the timeline of when they show up. Um, so, and then I'll, I'll defer uh, to, to Assistant Superintendent Povolitis about that as to whether and how we wanna share that additional information, but we can look at what the difference of the students generated between the conservative and moderate are and have shared that information in the past with East Penn staff. Okay, I'm, I'm just, I, we're, we're tying everything around 2028, and that's fine, because that's the forecast that we have, but I think we need to be cognizant that we could see a slip, and we just need to understand, uh, you know, what that means in terms of schedules and so forth, and I'm just trying to understand if we're, you know, it doesn't sound like we're going to accelerate the schedule, but it could slip if, if depending on a number of factors, and I just want to kind of understand the, what the window is that we think we're because it will impact schedules and time. Yes. Thank you for the question. Dr. Whitney? Yeah, just one question about the option one and the redistricting, redrawing of the middle school lines. Do we, I, I appreciate that free and reduced lunch is used as here is the denotation of, of equity and diversity. Um, do we have uh, information about what that redrawn line would do in terms of the racial and ethnic makeup of those two schools? Would it change? Would it not? Would it be substantial change? Uh, yeah, we, we are we tracking that information? Yeah, we looked at ethnic and racial data with the staff as well. The the um the ethnic and racial breakdowns of the schools changes much less. I mean there's certainly small percentage changes in general the uh, ethnic and racial breakdown of the schools changes much less than the free and reduced rate does. Um, again, without sharing student personally identifiable information, um, we have looked at the ethnic and racial breakdowns as um, pieces of information around uh, where that focus, where the focused uh, neighborhood changes were for that middle school redistricting. Again, um, you know that's that was information that was uh, considered and tracked. Uh, in, in some of the planning meetings, and, and I'll uh, leave the, the outsharing of that information if we want to um, supplement this to uh, East Penn staff. Uh, 
Right. I have one other question. I looked at the data to show how the trend and capacity out to 2028. I looked at one school, West Coast Middle School, 74%. A lot of schools are a lot higher. Will we realigning or redistricting to make that school uh, more in line with other schools, or will we let that go? That's projecting and showing your data. Yeah, the, the geography of West Coastville makes that one a little bit challenging because it does sit along the northern edge of the district. There are certainly the fact that West Coastville, Willow Lane, and, and Shoemaker through the middle of the district are the three schools that do have capacity room means that there are certainly a lot of options, but also some ways to um, avoid affecting the most students. So it's a very fair question. And we, we didn't do a fully comprehensive sort of talk on some of the criteria that we use. But this is one of those cases where because 74% and the underlying size of the student body was sufficient uh, for East Penn staff analysis, we made the decision to not affect more students by moving them to balance the capacity percentage when the percentage utilization and the size of the student body uh, was deemed sufficient. Now, this is true with all boundary analyses that we look at. There's always little tweaks that, that, that can be done and are introduced throughout these processes. But generally speaking, the analysis was made that affecting more students in order to get the percentages closer to each other uh, might not be in the best interest of those students. That also, if we did balance that with a better utilization of the school, where we have a better of resources for the students, if we did balance that school, no, we don't think slightly balancing that that number would impact resources. But we would just go right right now and look at this as just an outlier at this point. Right. So we looked at what would what made the most sense for moving students, trying to minimize uh, the amount of movement, but at the same time making sure we provide the appropriate and equitable resources for the students. There, there, there's always going to be slight changes um, in utilization from one building to the other because of um, developments and, and how you draw the lines. It's never going to be exactly perfect. So we, we did the best we can. And I will say, you know, there's always slight movement that could occur once a decision is made. There's, this is not a definite carved in stone done deal. Slight movements could be made, you know, um, as we move through this process. I think it's also important to note that West Coastville is currently our self-contained autistic support program. So when you see that occupancy, you're also looking at um, classrooms that are capped at eight for all of the self-contained autistic support classrooms in terms of space at West Coastville. I'm glad you clarified that. Thank you. Any additional questions? All right, I think we're ready to move on to the next phase. Okay, at this point, we're going to dive into um, looking at the facilities. And so we have joining us Steve Behrens from Breslin and um, one of his teammates, Mark Buffalo, is also joining us. So I'm going to turn things over to Steve. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to present. I would be remiss if I don't identify my team, Mark Buckaloo, here with me tonight. Also back in the office, uh, Michael Ackerman both talented architects at Breslin. And, um, and I'll echo some of Dr. Campbell's introductory remarks about the interaction and the collaboration with the team, the district level um, and uh, the building level and the FIT committees and, uh, and even Zach um, graciously answering lots of our questions about his, his work as well. So with that said, um, jump right into the uh, facilities options piece. So this slide does represent our, our, our datum, so to speak, of reference. And so we'll start with the option one K to eight redistricting model. As Dr. Campbell mentioned, this includes additions to Albertus and Lincoln Elementary Schools and uh, an addition to LMMS and a renovation of IR. So again, a chart that might be a little bit difficult to read, but this, this is the, the orientation to each option, in this case, option one. And what, what you'll see here is along the, the left-hand side, the elementary schools, the middle and the high, and then um, with uh, the, the results of the redistricting, um, 
the the effect on on the facilities and and their capacity. So, as as has been mentioned, what we're indicating is uh, additions to Albertus and Lincoln, and um, we've alluded to why, but I'll, I'll just reinforce that that is uh, the result of looking at the capital needs of those buildings um, and, and their uh, core facilities and how they're performing in support of the education. And then their opportunity to add capacity at those buildings where uh, geographically it makes the most sense. So this option one does include those those uh, additions to Albertus and Lincoln. And then uh, when we look at the uh, the six to eight uh, schools, higher middle school gets a renovation that we'll look at in a little bit more detail in a moment. And um, LMMS has both an addition and, and renovation component to it. Common with both of the, the options that, that we'll present are the options for the high school. And those are at the bottom of the chart an expansion and a renovation of the existing building here. And um, option B, 3B, is a new building, a replacement building on this campus. And then option 3C is utilizing that district-owned land in Albertus to create a new high school campus. So I'll share a few diagrams as we, as we move through the presentation. Um, just want to point out that these are diagrammatic. This is a feasibility study analysis, so they're conceptual in nature, but helpful to still to um, help help envision uh, the options that we're referring to. So this is uh, the Alberta School and Site, and this would include a classroom addition, and we're looking at um, uh, approximately uh, six classrooms here an expansion of the cafeteria. So one of the known identified needs in the feasibility study is related to the core facilities of the building, specifically the cafeteria. So any addition to the building would require that. And then for each of these options where we're including um, uh, additions and renovations, we're also addressing the capital needs that were identified in the study. And we worked closely with Mr. Aneshko and and in evaluating those, those capital needs, we, we do take that into consideration. And so we would assume that the um, that addition renovation projects would, would include uh, addressing those capital needs, whether they be um, code related, ADA related, general finishes, um, particularly with these older buildings, uh, those needs are most prevalent. And then looking at Lincoln, again, from this diagrammatic bird's eye view, a classroom addition there as well, and a expansion of the multi-purpose room, again, to address the capital needs and the capacity and, and support for the core facilities of the building. Moving on to IR, a little bit more of a, of a careful look here with respect to the floor plan. So, um, we're, we're looking at the opportunity to improve the educational delivery at, at IR. So there's, there's not new footprint associated with additions, additional classrooms, or that sort of thing. But as we looked at the needs at IR and the opportunity to improve that, we really did want to include a renovation of that building in this option. So on this, on this uh, first floor, this would be a phased renovation approach where we'd be looking at updates, providing new STEM space uh, to the building, more, uh, more contemporary curriculum delivery, renovation to the family consumer science and, and tech ed areas. And then um, uh, renovating that, that, that core facility in that area below the library to, uh, to ease circulation, improve circulation, and look forward to um, improvements to the educational delivery. Then if we're to look at the second floor, we see the library area of the building as the opportunity to create a hub within the building. 
there was a need to renovate and improve the pod areas of the building. So that's what is, and those are flanking, as you'll see to the right and left of the, of the library space. At Laura McCunji Middle School, talking about um, a building addition here. So this would be a classroom addition to the building. Again, a need to renovate, expand the cafeteria and kitchen to support that, and then address the, the capital needs throughout the building. So um, there's, we are showing an addition on this building because the, uh, those out year projections that Mr. Champagne was making reference to that beyond that, that, uh, that 2028 timeline, that's when we see the uh, projections to middle school level creep up. And so we do anticipate the need in combination with enrollment needs, as well as special ed needs that, uh, that uh, would be need, need to be addressed at the six to eight level and the economy associated with doing an addition onto one of the buildings instead of two, that's why this is, this is proposed. So then if we move on to option two, that's the K to eight realignment option. This is indicating additions only at the at the middle schools as we would convert those to five, six, and seven, eight um, facilities. So as you can see again on this chart, the, the upper portion there with the elementary schools does not include addition renovations. That's, that's due to the fact that taking the fifth grade out of the elementary schools does create substantial space to, to address um, uh, any, any enrollment growth, but it does more than that. It, it also creates swing space in the buildings where we can address those, those capital needs by moving students around. Um, it reduces the stress on some of the core facilities in the buildings where, where they're, they're feeling pressure um, in that area. So that, that creates a lot of opportunities at the, at the elementary schools to address the, uh, the capital needs in a, in a um, in an effective way with taking 20% of the students out. So then with um, <clears throat> the, uh, at the middle school level, Again, we're, we're creating a five, six, seven, eight building. So instead of having half of the six to eight population in each of the buildings, now we have the entirety of fifth and sixth grade in one, which, which for the purposes of the study, we've evaluated IRE as being the five, six building and then LMMS as the seven, eight building. So as you can see in the chart here, there is addition renovations proposed for both of those buildings and then those common options for the high school as well. If we look at, at, at some diagrams, we can see how um, the, uh, the higher middle school could be converted to a five, six center with an addition. And we're looking at, in both cases, 10 to 12 classrooms, depending on how things would flesh out in terms of special ed needs or, or uh, balancing the, uh, the, the district between the two buildings. Um, this would still involve those renovations I described a moment ago to the core facility, perhaps even more crucial here to renovate the building in that regard, because we would envision that that library space at the center of the building being a core um, hub and a desire to create sort of a, a fifth grade house and a sixth grade house within the building. And, um, and then an opportunity for those to come together with shared facilities in the center of the building with the library. So again, uh, renovation options from option one, um, capital improvements to the building and a, a classroom addition as well. At LMMS, it's a little bit more complex. So we again, look at a classroom addition to add, add classroom space to the building. Again, renovating the uh, and expanding the cafeteria and kitchen to support the additional population. But now we're also looking at a gymnasium addition to the building that would facilitate the athletic needs of the seventh and eighth grade students. And because of where it's located, there'd likely be some displacement of some other program space band room, the choral room. And so there'd be another addition to the building to relocate that K 
conveniently to the auditorium, for example. But again, we're addressing the capital needs within these this building as well with a, 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 a phased renovation addition of the building. So to, to summarize those two, this chart addresses the, um, in, a, in, a, in a synopsis, the, the capacity and enrollment picture, as well as the projections. So as you can see on the left-hand side, the left-hand column identifies the current capacity of the building the, uh, for the middle schools, the, um, the redistricting option for IR and LMS, and then uh, the, a, a grade realignment option. So uh, the functional capacity, the existing functional capacity of the building obviously stays, stays the same in the, in the next column. Then we compare that to the enrollment projections. And we have several columns there that identify the power school projections under the various scenarios. And then uh, as we move over to the right side of the chart there, we look at the capacity difference, which is the highest projection for that, that, that building and that grade realignment over the next 10 years. So that may be a number that's a different from the 2028 number that you saw Zach reference in, in his charts. And in fact, it, it, those numbers do go up from there in, in some of the buildings. So we're reflecting for the purposes of, of planning additions and renovations building the highest over the next 10 years. And so that's what you see. We're comparing that to the existing capacity of the building. Um, a, a black number represents a surplus, additional space. A red number in, indicates a deficit. So that's what those last three columns indicate. And I would just draw your attention to the realignment options, which are indicating um, substantial deficits at the buildings because of how we're increasing the capacity there. And then finally, the high school options. So these are, are common between the options one and two as, as, a, as a set of uh, independent uh, scenarios, if you will. So the first option 3A is renovations and additions to the existing high school uh, here on the current site. So we looked carefully, met with the, uh, with the building level administration, with the FIT committees, got the feedback from them, uh, the district administration as well, and began to identify some of the challenges with the existing building. It's a building that's been added to over time. Um, and all of those additions didn't necessarily, uh, didn't have the benefit of working back through the entirety of the building to address core facility needs. And then also created somewhat of a patchwork quilt of, of circulation paths through the building. That was a lot of the feedback we got with regard to um, difficulty of circulation. And um, so, what, what we looked at was a way to, to sort of clean up those aspects of the building, provide modern uh, state-of-the-art facilities that address really in, in, in terms of the additions, the needs of the building. There, there were wants and desires that were beyond that that might be addressed with some of the other options, but how, how can we address those needs and then um, and, and, and make the building a, a better performing facility? So as, as we looked at that, we saw the opportunity to sort of connect those longer vertical corridors, a remove uh, the sea wing and the, uh, the auditorium, the existing auditorium, the, um, the area there between, and so and, uh, provide a unifying addition to, the, to this building. And some of the key features there would be a new uh, auditorium, a new gymnasium, auditorium would capacity would be in the area of a thousand seats, the gymnasium about 3000 for the purposes of uh, housing the entire student uh, pop population for an event, but also a new administration. And then as, as you can see on between the addition and the existing building, a concourse that would really pick up the ends of those corridors as they came from other areas of the building and, and create a, a much clearer, cleaner circulation path and, and unify the addition. 
So this is um, the existing building at just about 450,000 square feet, has an existing capacity of about 2,770 students. Um, the new addition would account for 184,000 square feet, would increase the, the capacity of the building to about 3,200. It's an increase of about 430 students. The, uh, the resulting building, um, and that, that does include the administration building here that we're within, would be about 630,000 square feet. So in addition to the addition that is being proposed, a new footprint, so to speak, we would then also back through the existing building with substantial renovations in some areas, perhaps gut renovations to try to um, really convert the existing space, fix the areas where there's um, classrooms that just aren't performing as, as they need to, and, and, um, and then address the needs of the, the, the existing gym that's being, that's being uh, replaced. That could be an opportunity for, uh, for improved band choral spaces, some of those spaces that, that require larger volumes. So we're, we're anticipating some areas of heavy renovation, but then just a generalized renovation of the existing balance of the existing building. When we look at the, at the, at the scope and the, the room schedule and the cost here this, on this slide, again, a lot of numbers that would probably be good to, to digest. Um, uh, when, when they can be more easily read. But again, we, we looked at this carefully in terms of developing a room schedule for the, for the building. Again, at a feasibility study level, so a lot more uh, work would, would go into this if, it, if this option were selected to move forward. But um, identifying costs with respect to site development, the new construction, the extensive renovation in that zone, where the new addition would uh, interface with the existing building, and then uh, costs associated with the general renovations of the building. So then when we add both hard costs and soft costs here, we're uh, totaling up about $186 million. What I will say is this, the scope of those general renovations, again, that would be the result uh, in an ultimate design, a result of a lot more conversation, a lot more detailed analysis. And so, you know, we, we, we can pin down what we have in the new addition. We understand those extensive renovations that would tie into it. But with those general renovations, I'll, I'll just note that there's some flexibility in terms of how deeply we would go with that. So this, we see this as the upper um, limit of, of that project. 3B, this is a new high school on the existing site. So a, a phased replacement of the existing building. And you can see the footprint there in the, in, the, in the drawing in red, that's the existing building. So we would begin the construction around the existing building that would obviously displace some athletic facilities for a period of time. Um, but ultimately the, uh, we would, we would do in, in a phased replacement of the building. The uh, district office that they were presently in could remain. Um, but then this gives a, a, a very good opportunity to do better site circulation, separation of buses and cars, provide adequate parking on, on site, create a core facility wing that would include gymnasium, auditorium, natatorium, and then um, a three-story academic wing as well. And, um, and then on the footprint of the existing building, for the large part, that would then be a place to uh, reconstruct those athletic facilities on site. So um, again, a diagrammatic approach, but the result here would be a new building of approximately 500,000 square feet. The existing district office to remain would be about 56,000 square feet. Yes, we do believe that this could be done in a slightly more efficient square footage total than the existing building. You'll see that this is a little bit less. And uh, we would, have, again, have a functional capacity of about 3,200 students. Um, 
and, and we've we've identified you know the bus parking, the car parking, and compared that to uh, to the existing as well. So then finally, uh, option 3C is a new high school on a new site. So this is the 76-acre uh, site that is, is out near Albertus, and it, it's presently a, a farm field. So we, we did a, a little bit of analysis of the site. Much more would have to be done um, leading up to any, uh, any construction project or submittals, but what, what we've identified is there's, there's some, some topography to the site. We've identified some non-buildable areas, some depressions on the site, that those are those wooded areas. Um, there would be a need for buffers to the surrounding areas. There's a, a, a township owned parcel. We would need to identify some access points to the site. But if we were to envision a couple options for a new building, this would be uh, an option where we could engage with those, those, uh, those prominent landscape features on site, provide um, certainly ample parking to the site, provide opportunities for open space, recreation of, of, of the stadium on the site, athletic facilities. We look at another approach, this approach is, is, a, is a scheme that responds a little bit more to the topography on, on the left-hand side of the site, stays a little bit further away from, from the non-buildable areas, but again, uh, an opportunity for new athletic facilities, um, leveraging that open space, views, and then providing um, ample um, parking on site. So again, this is a, a 500,000 square foot building, again, with a functional capacity of, of 3,000 students or more. Um, there's, we've identified um, about eight to 10 acres on the site that even at, at first glance in a, in, a, in a study like this, we can identify as, as not, not available for total. So when we look at the price, of, of this, again, looking at, at things uh, carefully from a room schedule standpoint, while this is the same size building roughly as the new building on, on our existing site here, it, it, there's, there's a higher cost that's primarily associated with the site. So there's more land development to be done out here. Um, there's the, the, the need to re, re, uh, relocate athletic facilities. Um, there also is, is the, is the um, possibility of, of special foundations on the site because of, of some of those features that, uh, that are evident with the depressions. So this is um, uh, budgeted out at, at approaching $260 million. Can I jump in real quick? Um, sure. I saw a price point for 3A and for 3C. I didn't see one for 3B. Right after slide 45. Okay, 3B is about $12 million less then, than 3C. Okay. Um, I can't explain that missing slide. I apologize. <clears throat> we will get that into the presentation before it's posted. Um, so when when we look at how this how this could play out from a phasing standpoint, we would um, look at these scenarios, and these will dovetail with uh, scenarios that 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 are, are um, paint the financial picture, which will be up next. But scenario one and scenario two are related to the redistricting options, and the difference between them is. The, uh, the high school option that's included, and that's 3A and, and, and 3, 3B. So um, what we need to obviously think about is, is not only the cost, but the schedule. And so what this is just depicting at a high level is, is a way that this prod, these projects could phase out. And um, you'll see, I'll, I'll note that we are looking at, for the purposes of this illustration, a decision to move forward um, in, in 
the first quarter early 2024, and then the time associated with design, with review, with land development, with review by the district, and um, that uh, the we would look to do the additions to the elementary schools first because that's where the students will, will present themselves first, and then the middle school work in a phased fashion, and then ultimately the, the high school work behind that. So if, if this were to play out as this scenario depicts with a decision early next year, we'd be looking at a, at a completion in, in 2029. And then the, the number, the cost in the gray bar then is the sum of the, the, the total set that were presented previously. Now with um, scenarios three and four, that's option two. And so that, that requires a little bit different alignment because with the grade alignment, we need to have those five, six, seven, eight centers coming online simultaneously to, uh, to address the, the grade realignment. So again, if, um, and we don't have those, um, those additions to the elementary schools in here. So if we were to um, pick a point, for example, the beginning of the 27, 28 school year, we would back up from that and, and identify the, the, the uh, addition renovation schedule for IRE and LMMS that, that could start um, in, in 2025. And then again, the, the, the work at the high school and then uh, these, these schemes essentially then ending at the, at the same point for, for parity and conversation. Right, so with that, I will Thank you for the opportunity again to, to, uh, to present this. And it's a lot of information, I know. So we want to open it up to questions and conversation. Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Barron. Just so that the public knows, can you go back to the slides on the costs for the elementary school renovations and the uh, middle school? So, the first, I think, is on page uh, 29. I don't think you indicated the total cost of those renovations and how they break down between uh, the elementary schools and the middle schools. So just so the public has a clear indication of what that cost is. Could you go through those again and, and what that total totals out to? Option one and two or both? Uh, both, okay. both, both, both options. Okay, so option one here, we have a subtotal for the addition renovation options at Albertus and Lincoln at 21, just over $21 million. Now that does, and again, as I was explaining earlier, that does displace or, or uh, include some of the capital needs into those renovations. So that would, that would reduce the, the final column, the needs of the 10 year capital plan. And so the, uh, those, the italicized numbers in that far right column are the, are the numbers that, that are included in the addition renovation numbers. So that essentially um, the, those, those italicized numbers do not total up then in the subtotal at the bottom. So I wanna make sure that's clear, but that would, then for um, IR and, and LMMS, we have the respective additions uh, and, and renovations of LMMS, renovations only at IR, and those total up to $39 million. And then that then a subtotal for K to eight is, is depicted there in bold. Okay, so that's that's about $60.8 million. And then below that is then the, um, the independent options for the high school. So uh, that, 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 that's then what the scenarios that, that are to follow reflect, whereas each of those subtotals are, are added to one of the high school options. Right, and this table to, 
to Mr. Smith's point, you do have the three high school options. Option A, which is the renovate and expansion at 186 million. You have the new high school on the existing site at roughly 249 million, and then the new high school at the Alberta site at 259 million. And in all cases, you have included the impact of savings for capital that we would defer because of these renovations. And those will be followed up in the finance presentation and they'll be clear to the public that those are a benefit to how we would finance these projects. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank Could you do the same thing for the next, the, the yes. realignment? So here under the great alignment op re realignment option of option two, we don't have those addition renovation options at, at the elementary school level. So the column, the 10 year capital improvement column on the right hand side totals up to the $22 million that was identified in the previous study. And then um, at, the, at the middle school level, you have the addition renovation to both, the larger addition renovation to both schools. So that would be a total of just over $66 million. And then again, that under the, under the scenarios that follow, that would be added to the high school options to, to paint the, the picture. Now, again, you'll see those italicized numbers at the, for the middle schools. We would assume that the capital improvement needs would be absorbed, would be deferred, by, by the additional renovation projects. Similarly, uh, at the high school as well, if it, you, you'll defer the, the capital needs if you're doing, certainly if you're doing a, a building replacement, but then also we would seek to address all of those needs in a substantial additional renovation project as well. So just to summarize, the difference between the two options of either a redistricting or a realignment is roughly $5 million. So we're not talking a substantial difference in the cost elements that we have for both the K, K through eight options. Is that correct? That is correct. And then these costs are represented as what today's dollars? How would you care? How would you describe what these costs represent so the public has an understanding of what these costs are and are not? Yes, excellent question. These are today's dollars. Okay. And it includes contingencies that we would typically right. see in, in the project. So those contingencies could include escalation. They also include design decisions. They're forthcoming unknowns related to site. So it's, it's a contingency number that's included. And you'll see that on those detailed sheets that, that summarize the cost estimates. And the basis for your costs are projects that you currently know of underway, co current costs and so forth. So these are these reflect the current market environment that we're living in, in terms of costs for new buildings or renovations, is that correct? Yes, um, we are specialists in school design and we maintain a large database of um, our own project as well as others, projects as well as others. We are very familiar with the local construction market. We have projects that are that are bidding right now, and and numbers that are coming in. So yes, these are these are current market condition numbers that are um, that that have it behind them uh, current market trends and 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 decades of data. Okay, and then as you mentioned earlier on the renovation for the high school. There is some flexibility. So if we think about these scenarios and we think about having to do K through eight kind of first to kind of anticipate the growth and the bubble, the high school is kind of like the lever. It can move with the ability of the district to finance these costs. Is that an accurate way to think about it? It is, yeah. And and that's with respect to the addition renovation option. So that, that's why I pointed that out, that if you're replacing the school, you, 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 you have less flexibility, obviously, in, in the program that you include and, and the, 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 uh, the amount of the work, the scope of the work. With the addition renovation option, we, we notice that the high school is the last project in the sequence. And there's a logic behind that with matriculation and so forth. That then also gives us a little bit of a safety valve there to uh, perhaps adjust, prioritize 
the the general renovation scope of the building with respect to the financial financial capacity at that time. So it does it does give us some levers to to adjust. And one of the key elements of the renovation is that you need to obviously meet state regulatory criteria, which is so much educational space versus you know other space uh, in terms of a new gymnasium, a new auditorium, and so forth. So you believe that this renovation plan will it will be able to address that kind of constraint? Yes, yes. You're referring to Act Thirty Four. Yes, yeah. right. Yes, um, that's that has its challenges right now. We're um, because the per pupil cost has not really been keeping up with inflation. We're expecting, and before any of these projects would move forward, we would get at least one, if not two, increases in that per pupil cost, which we hope is catching up to inflation while inflation is maybe beginning to, to moderate. So yes, that is something that we would monitor very closely moving forward. And a, a, all, all these projects have, have challenges with respect to that these days, but we believe we are well positioned with what we're proposing here to satisfy those requirements. And the replacement of the C wing is really focused on science as, as, a, as an initial or STEM as an initial kind of classroom space. Is that the way? Well, yes, as well as. Um, we would look to that academic wing. That's a, that's currently a single story portion of the building with about 25 classrooms in it. The, the replacement of that would be with a two story um, wing that would have 30, 48, 48 classrooms in it. So that's where we're addressing the creating the swing space to move through the rest of the building for, for those phased renovations as well as addressing the additional capacity needs of, of the high school. Okay, last couple of questions and I'll catch it off. Um, new high schools, typically done under a referendum. I mean, I you know, uh, a, a price tag of, of a quarter of a billion dollars is quite steep. So can you talk a little bit about new high schools and the whole referendum process and the impact that that has and the you know what what has to be done and and what that really means in terms of kind of a go no go or black or white decision because it's not something that you can really change once you go down that path or or very very rarely can you change it sure yeah there's there's really two referendum scenarios one is if you move forward with a project and the bids come in high and they exceed the Act 34 limit by the by the percentage that's allowable, then you're 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 forced into a referendum scenario. That's we, we've never seen that occur because the whole design of the process leading up to that point is designed to avoid that. The other and the other um, referendum scenario is one that's that's anticipated, that's planned, and that's when the um, the cost of the building exceeds the the financial capacity under Act One limits, really for the for the for the district to to be able to support the finance. So that's where a voter referendum occurs, and so. Um, but that's a different process that's, that's planned. It, it would add to the schedule because there's, there's work that needs to be done. There's often a consultant involved in that. Um, there hasn't been a lot of success with that process in the state of Pennsylvania. But um, you know, there, there's no longer state funding for school construction under the old plan con process. So that may be something we're looking forward to and seeing more of in the future in Pennsylvania. Um, so, but that, that's, a, that's an intentional designed process that, that would involve um, a, a lengthy advocacy, explanation, justification to the community to garner support for it. And that, that would, that would uh, need to happen, you know, 
prior really to to the uh, the development of of the construction documents, the bid documents, long before you went out to bid, because that's again tied to the Act Thirty Four process. But but there is a substantial amount of design that would need to precede that, because typically the Act Thirty Four documents are based on design development, which is which is well down the road to the design of the building, so that you can get to that point where you're doing a detailed estimate of the cost of construction that then becomes your, your Act 34 limit. So there's a substantial investment in design leading up to that, that, that actual referendum act. So it's a multi-million dollar investment. It's not like 100,000, 200,000. We're talking five to $10 million kind of investment that the district would outlay. And if the referendum failed, the district, that's foregone money. Is that Correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. It could be that much when you're when you're talking about all the investigation, all the fees uh, that potentially a consultant to help with developing the campaign. Yeah, you're talking a substantial investment of time and money. Thank you. Thank you for those questions, Mr. Champion. Mr. Jankowski. Thanks for the presentation, uh, Mr. Champion. Asked most of my questions, so excellent questions. Um, I do want to follow up on one on one path with respect to option 3A and the renovations to the high school. And I think I think most would agree that the high school does need to be addressed. Has, has there been kind of work done or analysis on, and this is I guess both through the administration as well as as Breslin, um, as to what sub options are under 3A that that we might, because if we're going to be voting on something, I would like to see more laid out with respect to the high school that rather than just this 186 million, um, what, what are the priorities? What can be done at certain price points while still complying with Act 34? Uh, but I think it would be important for us to be able to see all right, we, we think, you know, we need, we really need this to be done. So, so if we just do this alone, it would cost this much. If we add in this, it would be this, you know, a couple of sub options. Ha has there been discussion or vetting of that? There was a process that, that brought us to this, what we, what I refer to as sort of the high bookend. Um, and so, yes, this is based on, on an evaluation of, of the most critical needs of the building with respect to what do we put in the addition, right? Um, in terms of vetting sub options, we, we could certainly do that as needed, um, but um, you know, we, we, don't, we don't have that presently, perhaps in the way you're wanting us. So then I look to the administration, is that something that you would look to do so that there's further, information available to, to, to potentially vote on at some point? Yeah, absolutely. I think at this point, um, as Mr. Behrens has articulated, like what you see are conceptual renderings. And so certainly as we move further in the process, um, we need to, there would be much more work to be done, including again, stakeholders to determine um, of the renovations and or additions, if that would be eventually the direction towards which the board opts, um, what would those renovations or additions be? Okay, good. I mean, I think that'll be a necessary step um, when we get to that point. And then, you know, kind of going back then to the to the middle schools, with with both both of the options there with the redistricting versus you know the the, the realigning. The, the the renovations, the work that we that that we're seeing tonight, is that the absolute necessity, or is that kind of the high end? Like this is what you know, this is what all in. This is what we would do, or is this what's necessary in order to accomplish the redistricting and the realignment? I would characterize it as substantially the necessity. So there's um, there's, no there's certainly there. more you could do, <laughs> but to but to address the priorities of the core facility needs, the um, the vision for um, separate houses associated with 
the, those those grades occupying the building together. Um, it's um, it it a solid, well sort of conceived, thoughtful approach that that addresses the the educational needs, the capacity needs, and the, the capital plan. And how, how much work is required to you know bring the buildings into compliance with current code um, in connection with these with, with these projects? I mean, how what percentage? You know, I'm not looking for precise numbers, but like what percentage? How out of code are these buildings that, and how much of that work would be required? Hmm. Well, the 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 capital plan in totality was about six or seven million dollars for both buildings. That that includes ADA improvements. That includes um, code. I, I'm not going to say that these buildings are replete with code or, or safety. Right, violations. I'm not implying that. Right, just curiosity. But um, but certainly there's grandfathered conditions right. that when we uh, go in and do an addition or innovation scenario, we we would address. Um, also, things like you know lighting, uh, just finishes, the deterioration of finishes over time. The buildings in the district are very well maintained. But eventually things wear out. Um, there's also uh, mechanical systems work associated with that. Um, so it's it's a comprehensive view. Code, ADA, those sort of things are, are definitely a piece of that puzzle. Thank you. Ms. Norman. Thank you. Um, I have uh, some questions about all of it. A lot of this, I'm just trying to understand the plan or the, the reasoning behind the plan. So um, in the redistricting plan for K through eight, um, I understand the reason of adding classrooms. Can you explain why we need to expand the cafeteria as a multi-purpose room in that plan, but we don't need to do it if we move the kids, if we go with the realignment plan? Yes. Um, so it has to do with adding classrooms to the building. So the, in those, using Lincoln and Albertus as 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 example as we did, they're already feeling pressure in those core facilities of the building. So if we were to add classrooms and thereby add students to the building, we have to look at, at whether or not that those core facilities can support it. Okay. So uh, when we're adding onto the building, we need to address that. When students are being removed from the building under the redistricting, or I'm sorry, under the grade realignment option, now you're you're just by reducing the population of the building, you're you're relieving the pressure on those core facilities within the building. Okay. And um, does that answer the question? It does. That, that's extremely helpful. Um, and I did just want to reiterate something Dr. Campbell said um, that these renderings, I noticed like the one on Lincoln, it, it um, takes up a bit of the playground space. And just before people um, come to the next board meeting, protesting that just to say that that's, there's nothing set in stone there. We first have to figure out which of these options we're going with. And then if you were to expand Lincoln, that would be another discussion after that. Um, okay, can you, Similar question on, on the middle schools, especially the realignment plan. I didn't understand why LMMS would need a second gym. Hmm. Ms. Sure. Um, so that was something that we, again, just presented in a vision to the board if we were going to consolidate. One of the concerns that um, repeatedly was raised was middle level athletics and the impact that it would have in realignment. And so in that vision, you would host all of the interscholastic teams at Lower McClendon in the 7th eighth building with the 7th eighth graders with the two athletic teams um, and, the, and not be busing students necessarily to IRE to also utilize those gyms. That certainly the fail safe is just busing the green or the gold team over to IRE. And we're going to get into that more in the programming portion of tonight. But that was the thinking behind the additional gym at Lower McClendon. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Um, and then uh, from the different options at the high school, I'm just trying to add up different pros and cons of these different options. So 
options 3b and 3c are the only two that address our tight parking situation right uh 3a no additional spaces are added is that correct that's correct okay um and then when you talked about um in the 3a option renovation um going through the rest of the school and doing up uh, I don't remember what your word was, light renovations or something like that. Um, is that something that we, what those renovations are and which what they are needed, is that something that we would have more information about before we vote on? Because it just seems like I don't, to, to look at that price tag and not know what those are, it, it makes it hard to know, vote with confidence. Understandable. Yeah, I think that dovetails with Mr. Jankowski's uh, question as well. Uh, again, this is a square footage analysis okay. at this point. Um, yes, prior to moving forward with a approval of an option for the high school, we would expect that more definition would be needed on that. That's helpful. Uh, okay, and then um, of these options, you know, we have some space constraints in this that I think everybody who has ha ever had a kid go through the high school understands what some of them are. And I'm just trying to figure out if some of these get addressed. You had mentioned um, that the band might practice, I think you said this, in the old gym because you're building a new one. Is that right? Like, so that gives them a place to practice where they currently are using the student parking lot, I believe. Right. So we, we look at what, what would we repurpose the gymnasium, the existing gymnasium for in a scenario like this? And the the volume of that space, the high, high bay area, would, would lend itself to a band, choral, some of those types of functions that that could then be, um, be that could be renovated for that purpose. So um, that that's, again, the, the analysis that, that's embedded in this so far. Okay. Um, and yes, it, it would would give much more space than they presently have, and it would be purpose designed space acoustically and so forth. Um, I think for me, it would be helpful to understand what's possible with 3B or 3C that's not possible with 3A. Um, some of these I can guess at, but some are are really they're just question marks at this point without any without more detail. Um, and and I, I'm specifically talking about these things that we know are difficult with the current size of the high school and the fact that you don't have anywhere to expand. Um, like for example, when you do 3B or 3C, does the, is it true that the baseball or softball team has to practice somewhere else? Would they actually be on campus at that point? Um, like just, there's a whole, none of these are huge considerations, but it'd be helpful to know what is possible with the two bigger price tags that isn't possible with the smaller price tag? I, I can speak generally to the, to the building itself primarily. So 3B and 3C are new construction. Yeah. So, so you have the opportunity to build the, um, the current state-of-the-art facility as as effective as, as we could be in doing a gut renovation of portions of the existing building, you're still confined by the building envelope, the structure. And so you can only do so much, right? Um, so certainly starting with a clean slate and, and constructing new state-of-the-art facilities gives lots of options, not only in the, in the educational design of the space, which is which is obviously very important, but you're also just going to design a, a building envelope that's much more energy efficient. You're gonna be uh, introducing new systems um, that, that are gonna be, uh, and, and, and you're extending the life cycle, right? Predominantly because, okay, we go through and renovate the existing building. That's not creating the same long-term necessarily 30-year solution, 40-year solution with the new building, is. So you might find you're coming back 
sooner and renovating spaces in the existing building again, because you can't necessarily correct all, all of the problems. So it's, um, I think, yeah, what, what are you getting? You're, you're getting really a new purpose-built state-of-the-art facility to a degree that is really only possible with new construction compared to exist. Um, some of the other programmatic questions. And I'll just add, I'm, I'm not sure if you were explicitly interested, for example, in the athletic field, but to Mr. Barron's point, like 3B relocates the school potentially in a different area of the current campus. You can see that it would relocate it to where, to what is currently Memorial Field, the practice field, as well as the tennis courts. And so those current spaces that we have on our campus, I anticipate would likely be located over to what's now open. Um, I don't know that, I don't think we're at the point where we can sit here and say, yes, you would absolutely then be able to find space for um, a baseball field, similarly, because we don't have it. Um, similarly, in 3C, um, at this point in the process, I don't want to promise that we would pick up additional fields, not knowing, again, what on the, the new land is actually usable land and appropriate for fields. Okay, that's helpful. Okay, um, I might be asking too much here, but it, it, it's helpful to know to all of the variables and make these decisions. So if you do the renovation or the building, so if you do 3A or 3B, my question is what happens to the land over in Makunji? And if you do 3C, what happens to the land here? Do, do we sell it off to help offset the cost? All, all considerations to be made. Um, you know, certainly, and, and that was conversation that our facility inquiry teams had, just some preliminary discussion in terms of if the board made a decision to build on the piece of property that we own off of Route 100, what then happens to the current Emmaus High School? There are costs associated with just maintaining the site. Would, what would be the value of the property? To whom might that property be attractive? Um, does it create competition for services then, you know, depending on to whom it might be um, attractive. Okay. And do we, do we know the value of both properties? I mean, does, was that question answered? We don't know the, we don't know the value of the current Emmaus High School property if vacated from it by Emmaus High School. Okay. Great. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Mr. Bird. Yes, I just have a couple of questions. You talked about uh, some of the challenges of building a new high school. Can you talk about any challenges about the renovations of the elementary school? Any challenges that you know about? Maybe conceptual that you know about? Or maybe look at it. Yes, anytime you're going through an addition renovation project on an elementary school in on a tight site, as both of those are. There, there are challenges. There's challenges of, of site circulation, of phasing and, and lay down areas for contractor vehicles. For there's, there's just an inherent disruption associated with that. We have a lot of experience minimizing that disruption. It's a very common approach. It, it happens quite often. There are ways to mitigate it. But but there are challenges. There's there's then approvals and zoning and and um, you know the, the the variables associated with seeking approval from from municipality and so forth. So there's 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 challenges. Um, but I think the reason these sites were identified was not not being oblivious to those challenges, but recognizing that if the additions could be accomplished. At these locations, they the benefits out, outweigh those challenges, and, and and the benefits at those locations outweigh doing something similar at, at one of the other sites of, of the elementary school. So it was it was thoughtful in terms of determining that Lincoln Albertus were were the candidates. But but yes, there's there's challenges, lots of, of conversations to 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 take place around that, around mitigating that, 
but that's that's where a, a skillful team um, assists the district in, in guiding you through that. You talk about the high school, placing high school building last year. You talk about the life cycle of the schools. As we renovate these schools, uh, what of the life cycle of the school would be at the renovations versus where we are today? And is that uh, advantageous to do that? Yeah, you, you're that there's a, there's a lot of sub questions within that too. Um, <clears throat> so the, the new areas of the building would obviously be new and they would have the the, the extended life cycle associated with new construction. Going back through and renovating the existing building, again, to the degree that we do it, will affect that. So if it's a lighter renovation and you're, you're dealing with finishes only, you're not gonna be getting into the wall necessarily find, discovering and finding and repairing things that are, are hidden from view. If you're in a gut renovation scenario where you're really stripping it down to the structure and the building envelope. Yes, then you have a greater capacity to come through with, with new systems, with new, um, with new technology, and, and maybe even improve that building envelope while, while you're there as well, too. So it, there's a high degree of variability based on the extent of the renovation. But at the end of the day, no renovation can really create uh, the life cycle of a new building necessarily. So that's that's exactly the conversations sure. that we would have moving forward, and that would help with the prioritization. So, do in the areas of the building where the capital needs are greatest, that's where we're going to that's what we're going to prioritize. And so, to try to get the greatest value for the district out of the process. So maybe not. A, I don't know if there's a direct answer, but just, just to say that those are the kinds of conversations, the kind of value engineering conversations that would occur in a design process. As long as we understand it's conceptual, it's not absolute. Right. It's just, right. Thank you. Mr. Smith? Yeah, not, not a, um, a question per se, just to respond quickly to Ms. Bowman's comment or, or question uh, jogged uh, my memory of a conversation that we had had in part of our discussions in, in, the, in the inquiry teams. Um, and what to do with the land after the fact. Um, what, I, and we don't know what the value of the land is of the of the current high school, but if we were to build uh, in Alberta's, I, you know, everybody knows how um, scarce buildable land is in, in Emmaus Borough. I imagine that would be going for a pretty penny. Um, you know, the zoning considerations aside, there's a potential that there could be some pretty uh, explosive growth in housing on on, on the, uh, the the property where the high school currently stands. Then adding to our roles, completely messing up all of our demographic studies and now not having any place to build anything new because we don't have any more land to put it. So um, that that's not a path I'd be interested in exploring further, but just something to consider. Good point. Um, actually, Mr. Sure. Yeah, uh, so I just want to go back to the middle school plans here, and I think I guess in both option one and option two scenarios, um, I was wondering if we, this is more maybe a question for the administration. Um, the IR renovations seem to be very programmatic in nature, whereas the LMMS proposal seems much more, I guess, vague for like a better word and, and more about accommodating extra bodies. Can you explain why that is? Is there is there not a safe, is that just the relative age of the two buildings that these facilities need to be upgraded? Is there a similar wish list for Lower Mac that would uh, affect a, or that would define a renovation plan? Plan. I'll begin to explain part of that um, in the event that we make renovations to IRE. Um, we would look at eliminating the current pod spaces and creating classroom spaces. Uh, again, there are classrooms now, but they're in a central pod. So that's, uh, I think, some of what you see reflected in, in the renderings of IRE at this point. But there's also the proposed we want to upgrade those STEM spaces, FCS spaces, tech ed spaces. Our, te our tech and lab spaces, yes. So that's just a function of this because the relative age of those spaces, they're just no longer suitable. And so that's why. Correct. Yeah. 
So if we could go to the enrollment number slide, I guess it's 39. Um, and this is focused on option one, the redistricting. I'm just trying to understand um, the numbers here. So, and as, as we know now, and as the numbers here reflect the current status of both middle schools, IR is significantly under capacity. LMS is fairly significantly over capacity. Um, looks like in the redistricting option, um, that would stay, that would narrow a bit, but it would still be relatively the same. Meyer would still be under and Lower Mac would still be over. I guess my question is, um, if we're doing additions and renovations in that redistricting scenario, why wouldn't we try to get uh, Lower Mac under capacity? Uh, is it possible for us to get it under capacity based on numbers here? Um, and why would Iyer need additional classrooms if they would still be significantly under capacity? Sure. Okay. <laughs> now, just just to say that um, the th this is dealing with the scenario for for um, redistricting that was proposed by Power School. So, okay. as I think Zach might have mentioned, it you know they 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 sort of do it on a development by development basis, and and again, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of discretion in, in how you do that but so we're, we're reflecting those those numbers to align with, with our school um, numbers so. and we're going to get into this later in the programming piece but also some of this is a coming where I looks under capacity right now I have also full-size classrooms with autistic support again and that eight student count um, and so that's not that number isn't completely accurate when we talk about moving some of those specialized programs or making them equal in both buildings as part of this plan, either through redistricting or realignment, I will need additional classrooms and small group space in both of those buildings. Okay. Thank you. That helps clarify. Uh, and then I guess the only other area I wanted to go to, and I don't know if this is the time or place to do it, but it's transportation. <laughs> um, maybe it is. I'll just go there. Um, so for in terms of do we know, I guess, what the or do we have a ballpark figure of transportation cost differentiations in both of the middle school scenarios, um, particularly in the realignment scenario where the entirety of the district would be going to one building and also the other building? You'll see it in our financial slides that are coming up next, but um, in working with our transportation vendor, um, again, in conceptually what's being proposed, it would be about an additional million dollars of transportation. Uh, the green line would be about an additional million. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, I have some questions. Do you have a quick comment? No, no, quick comment. I just, I don't, the comment I was just was earlier. We have to keep all the options open at this point. We have a lot of options on the table. More discussion, what information we get, we will be able to make this decision. It's just conceptual now, it's not a battle of the politics. Appreciate all the presentations so far. Thank you, Mr. Burton. Yeah. Okay, I'd like to ask mine if I, if I could before we go back around. Um, so I know I asked something like this in a, in a different venue, um, and it kind of touched on which is on something that, that Mr. Bird had brought up before. Um, and I'm going to ask it now because uh, you know, to get her take on it, Mr. Harris. Um, if you look at these options, like option one versus option two, um, and and then an option three, you know, wh which option presents the greatest logistical construction challenges and disruptions to operations? And, and which do you think would be the easiest to manage in terms of the number of projects that go on at once? You mean between option one and two in, in there? Yeah, in if aggregate? You're, yeah, if you're going to compare, yeah. Negative. So, so you know, I, I'm just trying to think, you know, if they go in a certain direction, you know, how big of a, how big of a project is this going to be to, to, to implement? And, and, you know, and when, as you implement each, each addition or renovation, What's going to be most disruptive to those local operations in, in the school? You know, obviously we can do some stuff in the summer, but not everything can be done at that. Point. So, in your experience, looking at these options, which would, would provide the perhaps the, the smoothest path for implementation? 
So uh, I, I think the easiest way to answer that question is just to you know to, to look at look at what we know now. So what we know now is that option one requires work at four buildings, right? And, and again, excluding the high school, that's that will be a common decision, perhaps, regardless. But <clears throat> option two requires work at two buildings. So, um, and uh, to Mr. Champagne's point about there not being a huge financial difference between the two, just in terms of dollars and cents, um, but for that same similar amount of money, you're, you're having to do work at four buildings. That just by definition is going to in, uh, in, increase the number of, um, you know, Students that are impacted, the um, the uh, the buildings that are impacted, you know the, the uh, increased risk, you know, associated with work at four buildings instead of two. So I think you know, without getting too much into the weeds on it, I think that's um, perhaps a, a, the best way to look at it. I think as an answer to your question. Now, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that. You know that 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 pain for that period of construction is 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 that whatever you decide is it is it worth the outcome? So I'd encourage you to also, and I'm not suggesting that you aren't with your question, but it also you need to think about in terms of what um, what what the ultimate gain is. So what and and. For years to come, what what makes the most programmatic sense? But just from a sort of hard nosed architect construction perspective, it's easier to work on two buildings instead of four. Right. I think that's the big picture I was yeah. looking for. And in terms of the, the high school options, obviously building someplace completely in a separate site is not is going to be far less disruptive. Absolutely. Than, right. And even if you were to build on the same site. Uh, another school, there will be disruptions, but maybe not as much as upending the entire structure. Right, right, exactly. Yes, yeah, certainly the ideal scenario for any anything is to be off-site where it doesn't impact any existing operations. Um, you know, it's on a site where there's no district activity at the moment. So again, from the architect uh, constructability standpoint, that's the ideal scenario. But um, the best tag associated with that. Right, right. So, I, and I, again, I, I asked the same question in different venues as well, but I want to get, get your take on this. Um, so, you know, we're basing a lot of this on, 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 the, on a 10 year outlook with, with demographics. Um, but, you know, depending on what we do and what happens with building, people moving in and out of the district, you know, there could be more, more growth. Um, Whichever option, or what, I mean, amongst the options that we choose here, do we see the possibility for um, added space for growth? Whether we do option one or option two, and then and then whichever the options of the high school that that, that we choose, and you know, and then sort of the part B of that is this is all a significant investment. And you're going to, you know, ideally we want this to last, you know, another 20, 25 years before we have to do something else. I mean, I think it's important to note that our existing facilities really haven't undergone a major capital investment for 20 years. Um, so I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Uh, the greatest amount of flexibility moving forward. Yes. And, and capacity. Yes. And in terms of, you know, right. should could the district grow more with internal credits and best flexibility? Yeah, again, I think um, just just from a from an accounting standpoint, so to speak, with with heads and desks, um, the opportunity to create that additional capacity at every elementary school um, sort of at once with with the grade realignment option does does obviously create the most capacity and the ultimate decision on whether it's 10 or 12 classrooms at at, at IR and LMS, you have control over that too. The economy of scale of adding a classroom or two to a project of that size is, is pretty attractive. So again, I think um, probably from that perspective, the uh, option two 
uh, creates the most flexibility and potentially the most space moving forward. Again, for this, for almost the same amount of money. Thank you. And thank you for your patience. Actually, that's fine because um, your questions led right into the one of the two that I have remaining. Um, I'm asking this because I can just hear parents, especially parents of athletes, wondering this. And um, I, I just, even if the answer is I don't know, I feel like I, I should ask it. Um, so option 3B, where you're building the new high school behind the old high school, then you're tearing the old one down and building fields there, potentially. Um, and it looks like that goes on for several years before it's done. What happens to the athletes who are displaced during that building? Like, what, what was the discussion around that? We would have to find available space where we could transport them to practice. Obviously, it's not on campus. Yeah. And, and does you feel like that's an that's actually a possibility to find space for them somewhere else during those years of construction? So there have been districts so that have worked with collegiate or, and or other districts to actually help accommodate like the actual games versus practices and then using community fields for practices. That's been something that's been done in the past when you have a project like that. Thank you. Um, and the last question. Um, so I think it was roughly a year ago where we just had like a, this is what these construction projects could look like before they went through uh, community input and such. And I, I don't know if I'm remembering this wrong, but I, I thought that the price tags, particularly at the high school, were much smaller. So I'm just wondering, especially on the renovation one, like, did that um, option expand in the past year? And if so, can you explain a little bit how it expanded? I think you're referring to options in the previous study. Yeah, yeah I mean, it was at a meeting roughly right. a year ago. Right, from the original. Now, I. I did study those to some degree, and the, the the scope of the work was much smaller. It was really just about adding classrooms to the high school. Okay. And um, I think that one of the discussions that we had was, is that perpetuating the situation here at the building? Or is that really solving the long-term uh, you know, is that the forward-thinking approach? So I think I think the project expanded primarily because we didn't want to perpetuate the situation that has existed in the past, where the building's been added onto in this sort of patchwork fashion without consideration given to core facilities, circulation, um, just and and just. A, a, a continuity of architectural character of the building, quite frankly. So, thank you. That answers that. That's all I have. Hey, thank you. Any additional comments? All right, a bunch of discussion. Appreciate your time with that. I think we're ready to move on to the next section. Okay, so we've taken a close look at several options to address capacity needs. And now we have Ali Mackey from Raymond James, who's going to share with us financial scenarios that are based on each of those options that we just reviewed. Um, and also Scott Shearer from PFM is joining us as well. So thank you both. Good evening. Um, thank you for the introduction. I can skip that part of my, my comments that I wrote. <laughs> um, I'll be reviewing the financing options tonight for the four scenarios that were just presented by Steve. Uh, first, we'll start with a summary slide that summarizes those four options. Uh, scenario one is the redistrict renovate option with a cost estimate of approximately $247 million. Scenario two is the redistrict build new option with a cost estimate of approximately $320 million. Scenario three is the realignment renovate option with a cost estimate of approximately $252 million. And scenario four is the realignment build new option with a cost estimate of approximately $325 million. 
Uh, in addition, we have taken into account the construction cost estimates and built the financial performance that we'll review on the ensuing slides, where we also include estimated new annual staffing and transportation costs associated with each option. The administration also provided us with the estimated capital plan savings for each option. So we have taken that into account and spread those savings over 10 years in each scenario that you'll see in the forward slides. Turning to the next slide, uh, this is what we're gonna do with scenario one. We're gonna walk through this spreadsheet in detail uh, so everybody understands how it works. And then we'll just hit all the differences and highlights for the ensuing slides behind it. Um, so this is our millage study for scenario one. This study is a point in time balance sheet that will continually evolve and be updated as the potential project is refined and things such as construction timing are more solidified. For this purpose, given the initial broad project timing that Steve reviewed, we've simply divided the total project costs for each scenario into five different bond issuances that occur from 2024 through 2028 in roughly equal shares. So if we look at the slide that you can probably not see from back there, <laughs> uh, in column two, we have the district's outstanding debt service as it stands today. Columns three through seven show the annual debt service associated with each one of those five bond issues I just mentioned that we would undertake to plan and fund the full $247 million in this option. We break up the issuances for a couple of different reasons. First, it allows us to phase in the millage uh, over a longer period of time. And second, every time you borrow, you have to have uh, a reasonable expectation that you're going to spend those funds within a three-year time period. So that helps with, on both of those fronts to split up the uh, borrowings to multiple borrowings. Um, you'll also notice that in each of these borrowings, we're assuming what we call a wraparound structure. This allows future debt to wrap around the existing debt and minimizes the upfront budget impact. Column H shows the use of interest earnings and or school district reserves to smooth out the millage increases required. The district currently has significant dollars in the capital reserve and the district will earn significant interest on both those dollars and any dollars borrowed but unspent uh, over the, the years that you're gonna be building and financing these projects. <clears throat> column nine is the total net debt service, uh, which is the totals of columns two through eight. Column 10 shows the new annual funding required for staffing and transportation that we outlined on the, the summary slide while column 11 shows the offsetting operational savings over those 10 years. Column 12 is the, co uh, the total of columns 9, 10, and 11. And column 13 shows the new mills required to fund the project, including the staffing and transportation and net of the operational savings. In this scenario, it would require a little less than 7 tenths of a mill each year for the next six fiscal years, for a total of 4.13 mills to fund this project. Column 15 shows this increase in terms of a percentage increase to budget for a total cumulative increase of 20.5% over that six year period. Column 17 shows any budget surplus or deficit annually as a result of the total financing plan. I wanted to note and point out that fiscal year 24 and 25 appear as deficits However, these are actually funds that have been internally earmarked for debt service um, until the debt service drops in fiscal year 2026. So they're not actual real deficits. <laughs> Additionally, once the millage has been fully phased in, the debt service budget, the district will see a surplus attributable to those operational savings once you have already incorporated all the required millage for the new project uh, staffing and transportation costs. So the next scenario is still scenario one, uh, but we, we wanted to not assume the natural phasing of the millage uh, that was in the first study. So we wanted to see the implications of extending the millage phase in to 10 years instead of six to lower the annual millage requirement annually. While that had the de desired effect of lowering it um, from seven tenths of a mil per year, per year to four tenths of a mil, it also causes the cash needed to phase in the debt over that longer period of time to balloon to 36.7 million, which you see at the bottom of column eight. 
<clears throat> that makes this option not feasible, but also prompted the question of how to optimize the use of cash versus stretching the millage phase in. So after discussions with the administration, it was decided to target using approximately $15 million worth of cash, which will be comprised of capital reserves and interest earnings to generate the optimal scenario based on the preliminary estimates. This can of course change as the project evolves. There's nothing locking you into using 15 million. We just wanted to kind of generate an optimized scenario so that we could review apples to apples for each project scenario that follows. So this is the optimized uh, scenario. This uses that $15 million of cash. So if you look at the bottom of column eight, you'll see that number there. And it allows you to achieve an eight year phase in instead of a uh, six year or 10 year phase in. That's column 13. For each of the additional project scenarios that we'll read from this point out, um, we're just gonna use that $15 million of cash to drive how long the millage basin can be. So this is scenario two. This is the optimized financing for the $320 million project. For this scenario, we're able to achieve a seven year phase in for a total of 4.95 mils or roughly a 24.5% total cumulative budget increase over the seven year time frame. Scenario three shows the optimized financing for the $252 million project. For this scenario, we're able to achieve an eight year phase in for a total of 4.05 mils or a roughly 20.1% total cumulative budget increase over the eight year time frame. And then scenario four shows the optimized financing for the $325 million project. For this scenario, we're able to achieve a seven year phase in for a total of 4.89 mils or roughly 24.2% total cumulative budget increase over that seven year time period. And that was a lot of information and numbers. Um, so I'm gonna pause here for questions. Uh, not a question, but I'm just, um, um, no, maybe it is a question. But something I wanted to to highlight um, for my colleagues, just in my own interpretation and how I'm reading the the different options here available to us, um, from the four year to the optimized to the ten year. My in my mind, I'm my mind is being drawn to the bottom of uh, uh, column fifteen, and that total percentage increase over the course of however many years it takes to finance the entire project. So that's the number that when I'm looking at this, that ultimately, um, regardless of what option and what combination of options that we go with, the bottom of, co of column 15 is the number that that is, is sticking in my mind. So we saw some pretty scary, big, bold numbers on that screen a few slides back um, when we looked at the different high school options. All of that, in my mind, is kind of baked in here and settles on that that the bottom of that column 15. And, and as I look at all of the different options, to me, in my mind, we're looking at, no matter what we do, at least uh, a 20% increase roughly over the course of X number of years, four, six, 10, however many it's going to be. So um, as we are not making decisions today, but as we are looking into making decisions in the future, obviously, um, cost being one of the big drivers of a project of this mag magnitude. Um, you know, I, I just sharing with my colleagues up here, that's where my mind is going to. Uh, yours may be going someplace different, but um, that's that's the, the, the focus that I have right now. So no, I guess no question there, but just something I wanted to share with my colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Jankowski. So Mr. Saul. <laughs> So if we look at the at these at the proposed impact on um, millage rates and the increases from an operational standpoint, how does that impact from your perspective um, ordinary operations from year to year over this period? And, and and you know, trying to address other priorities that the administration might have. It, yeah, excuse me. Yeah, I um I think it's it's very important to remember that that um, phase in the, the per percentage increase in phase in um, is would be above and beyond the the normal increase in operational costs, meaning increased contractual costs, increased utility costs, inflationary pressures. 
So I think, you know, be mindful that when you look at column 15 and you see those percentage increases, those percentage increases would be above and beyond the, or, or consider them if you decide to move forward with the project, they're a base, right? You've built that in as a base, you have to up that percentage and then um, your other inflationary pressures and things would be above that. So either way you want to look at it, you have to add this to your annual increase. And then we have <laughs> one index at play and right. almost as a cap subject to going to the public. Yeah, and, so and I'll remind you of the number we look at. Um, if you look at the average tax increase over the past 10 years, it's been just a little under 2%. So you can take that number and add it here and sort of come up with the, what an annual number might look like. Thank you. Mr. Champagne. Okay. Just a couple of points. So as we went through these slides, you said you optimize the amount of money that the district could contribute. Can you go provide a little background between the two of you as to how you arrived at that number? Because I think the public would like to understand we've, we've saved quite a bit of money for projects like this, but there's a, also some other constraints that you have identified in terms of the ability to use that cash, as well as how that cash is being used today and what you perceive it to be used for in the future and how you arrived at the contribution of 15 million. Because I think the public may want to understand, okay, you've got more than that on the balance sheet right now, but what, what is limiting how you use the cash you have? Yeah, that's a great question. So. We'll actually even just take a step back. And you know, the district has, um, in addition to its regular operating fund, has a capital reserve fund. It's a fund where we have set funds aside to address ongoing capital needs. Uh, aligned with that, we have a 10-year maintenance plan that looks like looks forward in over the next 10 years of our of our major major capital expenses. And so what we try to do is align um, the funds going into that fund with the expenses we have. Over the past handful of years, we have also set additional funds inside in the anticipation of a project or, or a process like this where um, you know, we would engage uh, in a capital um, improvement, capital project plan. And so the board and community may recall during my board my budget presentations, that you know the money we were setting aside, a portion of that would be used for a down payment, quote, down payment on a project. Um, so to, to your point, uh, Mr. Champagne, you're, you're correct. There is more on the balance sheet, but as we look at the um, projects that are forthcoming, um, some of that is needed for the regular projects in the buildings that aren't being addressed as part of this, of, as part of this project. Um, so we tried to look at, okay, Obviously, we factored in the savings here, but we looked at what would be a reasonable number that we could withdraw from that fund, um, still be able to fund the 10-year uh, maintenance plan and have a, a small contingency in there in case something were to come up that would need to be addressed that hadn't been anticipated. And then just so in thinking through these scenarios and understanding how we're thinking about the options that we're presented with. So if we look at how the, the district administration has presented the options. It's obviously the critical path for doing something is at the K through eight level. So if you think about the schedules that we have shown by Mr. Barron's, we're talking a 24, 25 kind of time frame. So the high school is further back and the way they've outlined the debt tranches kind of reflects that. But it also, in my mind, leads you to think about it in a couple of different ways. One, you have the, the ability to determine what you want to do at the high school and when you want to do it. So if you only did the K through eight portion, let's say, which is roughly 60 to $66 million, you're essentially using one bond issuance, maybe a little bit more. So your millage increase for just the K through eight portion would be substantially lower if that's all you ever did. Is that an accurate way to think about it? 
That is, and I don't want to steal Mr. Saul's thunder, but I think he inserted a couple of slides in his next portion to address only doing the, the K through eight portion and what the financial stuff looks like for just that okay. piece. But it's it's basically um, on the bottom of column 15, half, including the staffing and transportation costs. Yeah, and because this and the other thing I want to make sure people understand, this is not just a facilities kind of look. This is a comprehensive look. It includes those other costs that we are using to improve the programmatic needs of the district. So this includes the staffing that we would, in a normal construction scenario, you wouldn't include. But since we're taking a holistic approach, it includes all of the, the above, which I think is the appropriate way to look at it. So I appreciate that Mr. Saul is already anticipating that question. Yeah, and, and if I can speak to that point, if you reflect on the um, sort of slide that we were anchoring to, um, you know, the top part of that slide was the facility study portion, and then the bottom, you know, below the line had the the other costs that could be associated, and together they they are a comprehensive district plan, and that's what we have priced is the comprehensive district plan, not just the facilities portion. Hey, Jim, you've got a question. Well, well, yes, if that's okay, because I just want to make sure I'm understanding the answer to Paul's question correctly. Um, so apparently after this part of the presentation, we'll have a presentation on staff needs, which also comes with significant costs. Based on your answer to Paul's questions, those staffing costs are calculated into these tax rate increases. Is that correct? That's correct. And, and transportation and whatever else correct. you all know about that maybe isn't as big of a cost to talk about here. Okay, thank you. That was, that's, that was the main question that I had. Um, I did want to also follow up on, I, I for making these decisions, it is kind of helpful to have an average of if we have our usual, and I understand it changes from year to year, um, salary increases and um, benefits increases. Even if we don't agree, I can't think of how to ask this question. Even if we don't have a bargaining situation where we agree to a, a larger than usual salary increase, for example. So like the status quo that we have right now, what percentage tax rate increase are we looking for those on top of what's here? Is it like one to two percent a year on top of what we're looking at for the capital plan? For the <clears throat> excuse me, for for the annual um contractual obligations, yeah. inflationary pressure. Based on status quo. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I had referenced earlier. So if you look over a 10-year history to actually look at some some data points. Um, in the long range plan, we have that uh, page that shows that on average, we've been just, I think, 1.98%, if I remember correctly, just a touch under 2%. Um, percent. And that 1.98, but usually every year you have district priorities in there. The 1.98 is only the amount for salary increases. No, that was inclusive of all. Okay. That, I mean, that was the tax increase. So that was inclusive of all. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you. Mr. Bird, just to bring back on my colleague, Mr. Champagne, I guess the K through eight option is probably one to look at that on a separate basis, which will probably pick that number, which Mr. Smith commented that, that bottom number will reduce that bottom number. And listen to all of the things I've heard earlier. That is the most, uh, I guess, pressing situation that we need the K through eight option and not the high school. So I think if we look at that option, maybe uh, given the numbers in that, look at about the whole project, have a more realistic uh, idea of what the costs are, what the impact would be on the village. Okay. Any additional comments? Can I just make one yeah. comment because sure. I pulled out the plan, I just, sure. I stand corrected. Uh, the five-year average increase was 1.88, the 10-year is 2.27. Not a huge difference, but I just wanted to correct myself. Thank you, Mr. Saul. Okay, so um, and my, my questions were, were, were asked, but I, I, I think uh, I was thinking along the same lines as, as where, where we're at, you know, in addition to looking at the 
the capital expenditure, you also have to look at you know what space we have or what we're going to need in terms of our normal um, uh, in changing in, in operating costs and whatnot. So you know this two, two together kind of have to be looked at. And as to Mr. Champagne's point, these things can be phased in um, and you know perhaps prioritized in order to uh, uh, help uh, um, help improve the financial picture and maybe not have such a large increase. So. Um, all right, with no further questions on this part, I think we're ready to move on. Thank you for your Thank time. you. Okay, so the last portion of the presentation. Yes, I said last portion of the presentation. We're going to start to look at um, the vision for the educational program that we wish to build. Um, you'll notice in this portion, we're certainly talking more specifically about the K-8 to because that is um, the area in which there's options which could substantially change our grade level configuration. Um, I wanted to also clarify that we will speak conceptually about positions such as when we talk about student or staff support, although I did also just want to clarify that we're not um, in tonight's presentation. We're not looking at this in terms of a personnel presentation where we're looking at numbers of positions in each option, but we're just going to talk about those conceptually. And again, in purposes of building financial models, wanted to um, assure the board as well as the community that, yes, we're looking at the costs associated with facility changes, but we have also looked at this as a comprehensive plan. And so we did include transportation. We included those um, general anticipated personnel costs as well. Um, so with that, um, I just wanted to briefly remind our, our board, our community about the priorities that have guided our analysis of these options, including opportunities, academics, equity, and finance. And specifically, when we talk about equity, um, you've heard equity addressed in multiple ways throughout the presentation. And so certainly when we talk about equity, we can talk about equity in terms of student demographics. Um, in this portion of the presentation, we're also talking about equity in terms of the how the K-8 options allow us to equitably address direct services and school supports, including things such as administrative supports for um, our academic programs, school safety is certainly a consideration, counseling and behavioral supports. So when we counseling, that's where we're talking about school counselor positions, behavioral supports, including but not limited to positions such as our student advisors, which we currently have at the secondary level. When we think about equity in the K-8 to model, we're also um, specifically being very mindful about equitable access to our intervention programs that we have at Tier 2 and Tier 3. I know with our board, um, we've certainly talked a lot or shared a lot of information about our um, work to build tiered supports through the MTSS process. We're also talking about equitable access to special programs. That was a question that we appreciate that came up and we're going to address some preliminary thinking about that tonight. And then again, also giving careful consideration to those curricular and extracurricular opportunities for students. So as we look at the K to eight model, um, specifically option one with redistricting, there are several considerations that we have um, pointed out that we think some might perceive as advantages to the redistricting model. Specifically, a consideration is that, um, again, this is a model with which our community um, is familiar and it maintains the current number of transitions for our students. It also, um, with regards to the redistricting, we recognize that redistricting at the middle level will address or create, for the first time, hopefully, some logical boundaries for each of our middle schools. Um, I'm also going to jump down to one in terms of it also begins to allow us to balance our middle school enrollments in terms of 
demographics as well as overall count or number of students. It allows us to keep the grade level cohorts in each building smaller. Um, again, logically, I think we can appreciate that having sixth, seventh and eighth grade in IRE creates smaller grade level cohorts as opposed to having all fifth and all sixth graders together. It also provides access in each of our buildings to a continuum of special ed services. The exception is um, currently our autistic support program for the middle level is at Iyer Middle School. And in the redistricting plan that the intention is, the preliminary plan would be that that would continue at Iyer. And then again, athletics and activities are happening on the current campuses except where we have combined teams. So just as a quick reminder, what we mean by that is currently for PI, AA, middle and junior high sports, seventh and eighth graders are eligible, eligible to participate on those athletic teams. Right now, most of our, um, our teams are separate. For example, we have IR teams and we have lower McCunji middle school teams. There are some combined teams. Um, that we have, again, just based on um, overall numbers of students. So those are what we see as conceptually high level um, considerations, again, many of which could be perceived to be advantageous to a redistricting option. We're now gonna look at the K to eight realignment model, specifically, um, again, creating K to four buildings and then two middle programs, including a 5-6 building and a 7-8 building. I'm gonna spend a little bit more time explaining this simply because this grade level model would be something that's new for us. Um, and the survey from families and even some of the questions tonight indicated to us that, again, based on the 1,400 respondents, there was um, a receptivity to this particular option and also wanting to know more. And so that's where we're attempting to build this out a bit more tonight. The other piece that I really wanna emphasize is when we talk about building a model more, our team, and, and this includes members of our FIT teams, as well as um, I think many members, many partners who have described tonight, we see the five, six, seven, eight opportunity as one that's unique that we would develop programs in the 5-6 building and the 7-8 building that address the specific developmental needs. And when we talk about developmental needs, we're talking about the social and emotional needs as well as the academic needs of adolescents and learners at a really interesting time in their life. And so certainly you'll hear me reference later um, a site visit that we've taken to one 5-6 building, but something that we have learned is that um, this would be an opportunity for us to really build anew and design those two models in a way that meets the needs of our students and also addresses the priorities of the community. So what we're, what we're gonna talk about tonight is, again, preliminary um, decisions or recommendations that we would make in terms of what a five, six and a seven, eight building would look like not necessarily decisions that have absolutely been finalized and set in stone. Again, more conceptual and recognizing that when we have further direction from the board, if it were to be to move with a five, six, seven, eight model, we absolutely want continued stakeholder involvement to make some of those firm and more granular decisions. But we envision that the five, six building would would have would follow a schedule similar to our middle level schedules. When I say that, I'm not talking about start time, different conversation. We just mean in terms of following a daily schedule in terms of instructional blocks that is similar now to our middle schools, including having an opportunity to engage in exploratory and related arts classes. We absolutely envision that the 5-6 building would have larger blocks of time for ELA as well as math. And it would also give us the opportunity to build a consistent intervention time in that schedule. We recognize that the 5-6 and 7-8 buildings really give us a unique opportunity to have all grade level teachers. So all of our fifth grade teachers, as opposed to now currently being spread among 
seven elementary buildings would all be in a single building and would, would really provide a high level of teacher collaboration, consistency of instruction. And with that, when we talk about supports for teachers and following a middle level schedule, we envision that that team time would be really important so that the time is carved out in the instructional day for the teachers to engage in that collaboration and have those discussions in terms of what's happening in term, in, with regard to teaching and learning. Again, having a consistent intervention block so that there's uniform access to interventions and would also provide us with the ability um, to have consistent class sizes, whether it would be an honors class or an on-level class. The reason we bring that up in particular right now in one of our middle schools, again, just due to difference in size, current overall size and amount of staff in our two different middle schools. In some cases, we do have honors classes in which those class sizes are a bit higher than our on-level classes. Some further considerations for the five, six, and seven, eight building is that our students would have the ability, again, to access those lab technology spaces. You heard some of those spaces conceptually discussed in the facility portion of the presentation tonight. And when we talk about continuum of services and special education, we envision that um, particularly in the five, six and the seven, eight building, our students would have access to special education services. I do wanna point out the one um, further discussion that we would wanna have, and, and Ms. Bowman, this was to your question. You, I think you had specifically asked or brought up the fact that in the current model or autistic support program it is, is at IRE and therefore those students do not, are not necessarily always um, included with their neighborhood peers. And so what we would envision is before we make a final decision in terms of if the autistic support program would be at both the five, six, as well as the seven, eight building, that's really something that we um, particularly want further stakeholder involvement on because we recognize, and we'll talk about this in a minute, we're adding a transition into our students' lives in the five, six, and seven, eight model. And I'll, I'll further develop that. But you know, in thinking about some of our specialized populations, do we want to add yet another transition in their school experience? Is that ultimately what's best? Or um, would they prefer to have remain in that a single building for their five, six, seven, eight career? And so I say that simply to recognize that we can see both the advantages and disadvantages of potentially how we build those special ed programs for some of our students. The five, six, and seven, eight building would allow us to create greater equity and balanced caseloads among um, many of our, our professional staff, including special education teachers, ELL teachers, our psychologists, speech and language, um, without having to share staff. And so currently we do have some inequities in caseloads among our two buildings and the realignment would allow us to create um, more balanced caseloads in those positions, again, without having to share staff, which we find is at times, perhaps a cost efficient way to address those inequities, but ultimately it's not always the instructional model that best meets the needs of students and is not always necessarily most conducive for the professional staff members as well. We had a lot of great discussion um, in terms of the five, six, seven, eight building and the impact that it would have on our students opportunities at the middle level to engage in athletics and extracurriculars. And if you go back to the very beginning of the presentation, when we talked about opportunities, we always analyzed options in terms of, are there any models in which our students would have fewer opportunities? Or if we look at that in the affirmative, is there a way that we can create more opportunities for students in different models? So again, as a reminder, currently seventh and eighth graders in Iyer and Lower McCungie Middle School are both eligible to participate in athletic teams. So as an example, we have um, field hockey, cross country at Iyer. We also have field hockey, cross country at Lower McCungie Middle School. 
by having our students together in a single seven, eight building, immediately we recognized if we have just one team, suddenly now you have students who once had more opportunity having fewer opportunities because of a single team. So what we would create is that in the seven, eight building, we would still have two teams. Again, we're proposing green and gold. We certainly would work with a school and a culture to name those teams as they see fit. Um, so that our students in seven in the seven eight building would have the same access to opportunities that, that they had previously had. There was some conversation and question about what is the importance of the gym at one of the facilities or adding a second gym. As you can appreciate, if we have our seventh and eighth graders together, and let's say hypothetically we have two basketball teams, and if there's only one gym in the building. A solution would be that we simply, again, with transportation, transport one of the teams over to um, what was once higher, transport them over to the, the five, six building so that they have access to the gym. Potentially, if we add a second gym to the seven, eight building, we then have the space that students wouldn't have to necessarily complete, compete for access to that space. And again, always thinking through the lens of how could we create more opportunities for students? If the five, six building, again, had its same gym that it always had, we potentially then could begin an intramural program for our fifth and sixth graders in that five, six building. So we bring up the gym as an example of not an absolute must have decision to be made immediately, but just giving you an idea of how we really could begin to drill down and look at the specifics of the different options and how those facilities come into play in terms of opportunities for students. We envision as well, and this comes into play with some of the additional transportation costs, we would have fifth and sixth graders on one bus and seventh and eighth graders on another bus. We would not want fifth and eighth graders on the same bus. And finally, as we think about some additional considerations for the five, six, and seven, eight building, you heard me reference a site visit. We had a small team that did um, participate in a site visit to a local district that has a five, six building. And something that we heard from that visit was the benefit to kids of bringing all students in a grade level together as early as possible in their educational career. As you know, currently in East Penn, we bring all of our students together for the first time in ninth grade when they come to Emmaus High School. And uh, we, see, we see potential benefit in having all of our students come together to begin to build that culture, that sense of culture and community as early as possible. Again, in one model, it would be starting in fifth grade. Something that we recognize, and you heard me reference this as well, is we acknowledge that a, a key consideration that we discuss quite a bit is the five, six, seven, eight building adds an additional, an additional transition to our students during a really um, volatile time in their development during their adolescence. And so Currently, we have transitions between fifth grade going to sixth, and then we have the second transition in our students' careers, eighth grade going to ninth. The proposed model adds another transition. Um, and for some, there was, you know, we had some discussion about, is that a concern? And if so, how can we minimize that? So we talked a lot about the importance of building a culture and a community with a group of learners and doing great work in terms of clear communication, alignment of programming, curriculum experiences between the five, six and the seven, eight building, and just a real strong commitment in each building, again, to the social emotional growth, as well as the academic growth in both places. To accomplish this, because we also recognize that the five, six and seven, eight buildings create larger buildings in terms of overall enrollment or population. Again, conceptual, but what we envision is creating house systems in each building. So it's the whole concept, not a new one, of taking a large place and making it feel smaller and building that sense of community or family. 
This is an example of what the seventh and eight, the, the seven, eight building might look like. You would have a building principal, two assistant principals, each of whom lead or oversee a house or grade level. Each grade level would have an assistant principal, a student advisor. Conceptually, this board has been supportive of our student advisors through ESSER funds. Each grade level has two counselors who then attend to students or support students divided by alphabet. And this is where we have the opportunity in which a counselor um, would remain with those students for the entire year. There's also an opportunity in which potentially student advisors might travel with the entire grade level from seventh to eighth grade. Again, conceptually conversations we've begun to have. There was also discussion in terms of whether or not it makes sense for counselors to travel from seventh to eighth grade. We'd wanna have further conversation with our counselors because we also heard feedback that at times there's great benefit to the guidance counselors almost really knowing the curriculum well in a particular grade level. So those are the kinds of decisions that we would continue to map out as we look ahead. And so as we begin to um, bring things to a close this evening, we spent um, quite a bit of time mapping out for you a K-12 to comprehensive facilities plan. It's not just about the, the physical structures. We've also attempted to provide you with a vision for the program that we could, that we could develop. Um, and this board very much wanted to, to have a K to 12 plan presented, which is what we've done, including the financial options. We also recognize that this is a monumental amount of information. And certainly as you saw in the, the timeline or the phasing of, of work to be done, you recognize that we can't do all projects at once. And so several have noted, several on the board have actually noted, does it make sense for us to begin first with looking at a K to eight model? Not ignoring, not, not ignoring the needs of the high school, but we have to begin, we have to begin somewhere. And so many of you have recognized that in the short term, by the year 2028, we have some very real and immediate capacity needs at the elementary level that we know we need to address. And so this proposed timeline, again, developed with board leadership is a place for us to begin. And what we are proposing is that at a future board meeting, specifically at November 13th, that the board would give us some, a decision on redistricting or realignment related to the K to eight option. What that would allow us to do is beginning in the winter of 2024, the first step would be an RFP for engineering services. And then you can see the dot, dot, dot in terms of that's where we really get into the nitty gritty of designing projects, program design, obviously continued updates and decisions to be made by the board. We then again, have not at all ignored the needs of the high school. And you now also have a sense of the, the K to 12 financial scope associated with fulfilling or addressing the needs of the organization. It would then allow the board, we proposed in spring of 2024 to begin or to bring back on the table those decisions about the high school um, and where this particular board or where the board would like to go with regard to those projects. The other piece that I wanted to add is, um, and you got a little sneak peek of this already, recognizing that we were, we were going to propose starting with a K to eight decision. We do have some financial models available so that you can have a sense as to what the funding potentially would be just for those options. Again, I think Allie uh, highlighted or covered those, but Bob, I wasn't sure, or Allie, if there was anything else you wanted to say. Sure, I was just gonna comment on them that, you know, that similar to the other um, scenario, scenarios, these are options, but the scenarios, um, you know, these two options use roughly $15 million um, from reserve. They're optimized and 
um, or the phase in, and you can see that as Ali had referenced earlier, they're about 50% in terms of total millage and percentage increase required, 50% of what the um, full scenarios we looked at earlier. So it's you know roughly two mils or a 10% overall increase, and they're phased in over either eight or nine years. So you're really more like roughly a percent per year rather than what we're looking at earlier. So it's about 1.25% for the option one, and then about 1.14 initially for option two. Initially, yeah. And these slides will be available to us because they. Yes. Yes. Or they'll be in the final presentation. Yes. Yes. That will be posted tomorrow. Yeah. And this includes all of the staffing and related capital. So it's a complete picture like we did before. So yes. everything's in it. Yep. Okay. All of that is consistent with the scenarios, just so you know, we used a consistent approach. Good, thank you. Yes, all the same financial costs that were included for the other scenarios. We felt it was important to provide this financial option as well, just in the, again, as we're proposing that in the near future, um, the board provide us with some direction regarding which of those options at the K-8 level. We wanted you to have the accurate financial outlook or, or model for that particular option, for both options, I should say. Yeah, I, I actually just have a question about your description of everything's in it um, to make sure I understand because some other staffing needs were mentioned to us, but they didn't come up tonight. So I just want to make sure I fully understand the staffing needs that are included. Um, for example, to do this plan, you would need to hire some additional counselors. I understand that that's probably included, but you also mentioned um, some positions that are currently paid for with ESSER dollars that need to eventually be paid for without ESSER dollars. Are all of those positions included in this 1.5% per year increase? Okay, so in the K-8 positions, I think what we had shared was, um, again, in redistricting what would be needed. And in terms of the 16, the absolute minimum requirement would be the 16 middle school teachers in order to have the three teams at both middle schools. Um, and then when you looked at the realignment plan, there were some other positions that we were featuring and that included um, sustaining some of the extra positions that we need. So we were looking at holistically, I think to Paul's point, it was a dilemma of, making it just construction based and or looking at holistically what we need in the next three years. Okay. And so I believe that's baked into the, the slide that um, we will receive tomorrow and or in the update. Yeah, yeah. I could just list what those positions are because that's where I'm getting confused. I think. And I will also say um, in some cases, particularly because the, the staffing phases, we were attempting to phase them in over the course of several years. Um, I should say the staffing needs for to phase them in over the course of several years. You're also getting um, a prelude of our budget priority process in which, um, again, I'll speak to the student advisor positions in which we found great success at the secondary level. And so recognizing that we are um, near the end of our ESSER dollars attempting similar to what we did with the elementary interventionists. Um, and that's not an assumption that all previously funded ESSER positions will make their way in the budget, but we've had the great fortune of really having individuals in our buildings working in those unique positions. And so you will see some of those brought forward as part of the budget priority process. But we were trying to be thoughtful and include them here as well. Um, I, I think what I, I, I'm, I'm appreciating the thoughtfulness because uh, especially with the bigger price tag high school, I don't think we can make that decision without knowing what the budget priorities are so that you can add the two numbers together and figure out if they go above the act one exactly. index. Um, but for, for just for the K through eight proposal, I'm just trying to get a list of the positions that are actually included in the tax rate increase. Um, and if you're providing that tomorrow, that would be great. Um, and maybe this question is too specific or it's for a different time, but I think when, when I looked at what you had provided earlier, you were not including the behavioral interventionists, and I was just curious about why. 
actually is the budget priority separate and apart we do we have included the if you're talking about bcba support we have included that um we had looked at four potentially four as part of the budget proposal process upcoming okay but they're not included in this i believe they are i they believe are. they are so if they're not listed okay. I, I believe they are and then there were some other things that were listed that didn't really seem like they were part of either redistricting or realignment. And so I, I think they're probably part of your budget priorities and you're just hinting at them. They weren't, look, they didn't come up tonight, but they were in a, those presentations, for example, building a cinder track at one of the schools, expanding the activity bus to four days a week, things like that. So the activity bus, um, I, do, I do not believe is in there, but the cinder track the, or the idea of the gym construction is part of the Breslin presentation. Okay, okay. Um, when, I guess before we have the next presentation, it would just be helpful to have all of that itemized so that it's clear what is included and what might be suggested to us at a later date. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. Um, Dr. Uh, thank you. So this is just kind of a foundational question and I guess it's just important. It's gonna sound as though I'm skeptical of this. I'm, I'm really not, but I, I think part of the calculus of making this decision is to understand um, all of the options, right? Including the option of, uh, not doing something with a 60 or $66 million price tag, right? So I guess what I'm focusing on is this strong emphasis that you're putting on uh, equity of access to educational programming and non-educational, non-curricular programming, which I'm fully in support of. But my question, and I can anticipate some others having this question too, what specifically is stopping us from doing that apart from a facilities plan that carries the kind of price tag that we're talking about. I'll begin and then I also will invite other members of my team who've been critical to this work. Um, but I think, again, just to begin to answer your question, because you talked about like, what can we begin to do absent 60 or 66 million? I think um, while not, the driver in the decision making, a critical piece for, for us all to latch on to is that there are capacity needs at several buildings that, that must be addressed in the short term. And, and, and I'm defining short term as like five year period of time. Um, so then to, in terms of, I'm gonna paraphrase your question a little bit. Why can't we keep status quo? and just address some of the, address, create more equitable opportunities for kids absent the additional millions of dollars. Um, we recognize that we would A, have to add staffing, which is included in the plan. And to do that, for example, in seven elementary buildings of varying sizes, we would have shared staff opportunities, which we've described as not always an ideal situation. Um, we also recognize that even with redistricting at the two middle schools, again, there's going to be some significant costs associated in terms of a, st a staffing needed to accommodate a larger team, in particular right now at Iyer Middle School. And I can give just a difference in the foundation, like the staffing and why that looks different. And I think it's important for the public to understand that we're trying to staff with a vision for either direction that we're going to head in so that we don't end up with the incorrect type of staff um, so that we are staffing these with the future in mind. And so when you think about it right now in terms of Willow Lane, where I have 600 students and I have one counselor, or I think of Jefferson, where I have two, four, or Lincoln, 249, um, or a smaller elementary, one counselor and the difference in direct services, that can look very different. But if we pull out fifth grade, should I be looking at a counselor position adding that to Willow, or can I look at a student sports coordinator who's able to run small groups and do some of the things that we currently receive from our community and schools and student support coordinator pilot? Um, and so that's really the intention behind gaming out that staff is to make the ratio and the direct services be more equal across the community elementaries as well as the two buildings. Thank you. I appreciate the answer. Thank you for the question. Ms. Bowman. 
Um, this is just a, I, I guess, a suggestion to the administration about how you're asking us to vote, because you're you have two completely different possibilities on here with different price tags and. Um, actually, I'm amazed at how much you were able to plan, actually more than two if you include the high school one, but how much you were able to plan knowing, not knowing which direction we were going to vote on having you go. But um, I'm finding it difficult to, I feel like we're, one, we need, as a board, we need to vote on are we going to redistrict or are we going to realign? But I also think there's a second vote that needs to come after that that only looks at the price tag and all of the items that you're asking us to vote for. Um, because there's a lot in there and I don't know if the whole board wants every single line item. And I, I think we owe it to the community to have a discussion about whether every single, especially the staffing and some of the, for example, adding a track, things like that, I think we need to have a discussion about that. So I think what's challenging, and I'll, I'll invite um, any any member of my team to speak to this, but I think what's challenging is that we typically go about staffing in incremental years. And so the board, you know, and will entertain the budget proposals of the upcoming year. And then we make decisions. Um, so looking at it in the long view, recognizing the board could change, you know, their direction or, but we needed to know which way this was going to go to know you know, what staffing positions we should be proposing this spring. I, I, I'm just asking for it to be, I'm not saying to separate it by years. I mean, you could separate it by month, one month, but for us to have two votes, one would be on which direction to go. The next vote on is, is what's the price tag. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Are you no, I was looking at Paul because I feel as if he had. A, well, I, he, I feel as if he had a reflection based on this Bowman's comment. I mean, I think uh, yeah. there's a couple of things that I I personally see. One is there's a critical path here that we have to understand, which is if we're going to hit a 2027 date, we have to make a kind of a fork in the road decision here as to are we going to go down the redistricting or realignment path, and that triggers a whole set of steps, which doesn't necessarily trigger what the amount is it but it gets the process moving in a certain direction so that the architects can plan the administration can plan for the the needs to support because building bricks and mortar is not what this is about this it's about what we're thinking is the vision for the district in a programmatic sense and the bricks and mortar just support that and I think what we have to kind of come to grips with so that that 2027 date doesn't suddenly appear and then we're kind of like in a, a real tough situation is how do you view the future for the district? And I think with the, with the way that the administration has lined this out is they've taken, I'll go back to it, a holistic view of it so that we understand the impact of everything that would be included with building those new facilities or renovating the new facility of the existing facilities. So I think to ensure that this board plus any future boards has the time and necessary and the information necessary, this process has been ongoing for two years. I think we've reached a point in my mind where you have to kind of make that decision. Are we going to realign or are we going to redistrict? And that's the decision I think the administration needs to then move the ball forward so that in the spring, you're presented with more detailed information about the actual costs to give the architects an ability to really scope out what's gonna be in those boxes. Mm -hmm. And you then have the administration kind of lay out a very detailed plan of approach on staff. But I think we, we kind of have a sense of what the price tag is right now, assuming we don't hear any big hiccups. We have a pretty good idea for just the K to eight model. So I, I I agree with this this timeline. I think was what we have to do. Thank you, Mr. Champagne. Mr. Bird. I just want to piggyback on that situation. I think what we got tonight is the future and the vision of the district. I think right now the district is looking for us to make a decision of where we want to go, how we get there. And I think we have to give that opportunity to, to go forward with what the future, what the vision is, and then give them that uh, 
leeway to say, hey, this is what we need, not what we want. I think that's why I heard tonight, what we need, not what we want. It's a, it's a need situation. And the longer we wait, that need's just gonna get bigger. But give them time to work on it and move forward and make that decision say, let's start here. This is a start. I think that's what I heard tonight. Okay, Mr. Bird. Mr. Smith. Thank you. With with all uh well, I, I wholeheartedly 100 percent agree with um everything Mr. Champagne just just shared with all of us. But um that being said, I, I do with all with I do need to take into consideration six members of the board um that that are are really digesting this for the very first time. Mr. Champagne, Mr. Jankowski, and myself have been and and the the rest of our team have been you know spending a considerable amount of time teasing out all of these different scenarios and and uh, you know everything that's involved. Sorry, it's getting late. I'm running short of vocabulary words that I can draw from at this moment in time. But um, you know that that are for us. It's been a conversation that we've played over in our heads and among our our small groups on on, on the facilities inquiry teams for a considerable amount of time and, and there are six other members of the board that are seeing this for the first time that said i wouldn't change the time the timeline but i just i do want to be cognizant of those of you that are seeing this for the first time um and and cognizant of the fact that in a few weeks we're we're making a and the the length of the, the time on the clock and the length we've been talking bear this, bears this out this is really the most monumental decision this board has had to make going back 10, 15 years, I don't know, take your pick. I don't know the last time we had a meeting this long, certainly not in in, in my time on the board. Um, so in those few weeks, we have a lot of, uh, that we're asking of two thirds of the board um, to, to, to really um, come to a uh, decision in their own mind of which way they are kind of thinking in that fork on the road. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know if that's a conversation that we can get those two thirds of the board to that decision point in their head and just really the one meeting on the 13th. I think we have to regardless. So I'm just couching my opinion with that. I think we have to regardless. Um, but I don't know if, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but initial impressions, um, thoughts about the two uh, forks in the road, just giving the, the uh, administration and the team just an idea of kind of where you might be thinking, where you might be heading. I don't want to make tonight go you know much longer than it already is, but um, I, I think there's um, just to have those initial thoughts put out there, I think is going to be helpful to kind of just you know square ourselves away as we head into a, a, another discussion and a lively discussion likely to be had in a few weeks. Um, so I, I just I'll make it real quick. I you know I can I can say this because I spent a lot of time thinking about this going back two years. Um, I'm I'm really excited and invigorated by the idea of the five six and the seven eight. Um, I know that there's uh, a couple of concerns primarily the number one being around transitions. Um, but as somebody who is very, very familiar with having four transitions, um, you know, having that extra transition at the middle level, um, it's not something that uh, I would shy away from. And it's something that I think we certainly can work with. Um, and just speaking um, on, on my own knowledge of the middle level learner, the difference between um, a sixth grader and an eighth grader, and hopefully my middle, middle level colleagues can attest to this, the difference between a sixth grader and an eighth grader is, is very, very different. Um, it's only two years in, in a school difference between the two of them, um, but there are uh, needs and um, specifics that are related to sixth graders that are much more aligned to what a fifth grader knows and is capable of doing than an eighth grader and so the idea behind having a a five six building which is a middle level building with an elementary flare and a seven eight building which is a middle level building with a secondary flare um 
is is a is a pretty unique and interesting and exciting um, option for me to consider. So, not putting everybody on the spot. Don't please don't interpret that this is what I'm what I'm looking for here. But just in terms of um, potentially saving um, some additional time in a few weeks, um, that's kind of where I'm at right now. So, um, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Jankowski. Um, I, I think, uh, first of all, I think the presentation, all the presenters did a fantastic job tonight. Um, level of information laid out for us, I think it was well done and very helpful. Um, I, I, for one, am not prepared to say which way I'm leaning at, at, at this juncture. Um, what I would be interested in hearing, though, and would be helpful is, and, and I mean, I can glean from here and the comments that were made where the administration is leaning, but I think it would be helpful to, to, to hear clearly what the administration, like what, what, what option the administration would prefer, as well as what feedback you've received from the teachers and, and what, you know, if you've received an indication of what option our, our teaching staff uh, is leaning towards, if you have a clear um, indication from them, um, I look to my team who was also present for the faculty sessions. I'm going to start there in terms of, um, I think there are certainly some, I sense, I sense several, of, I sense the elementary group certainly saw the value in the five, six, seven, eight. Um, I think where we see perhaps differences of opinion might be in particular at our middle level buildings like and and I will say that makes sense to us because those are the buildings certainly there's there's impact all seven elementary buildings but the middle school program in some ways is really fundamentally changing um, from what from the great work that they've done for many years and so um, you know I think there's there's also we recognize that um, our teams have worked hard to build strong cultures in both of our current middle schools. And so I think for people to think about working in a different place with different people and not having that culture anymore, I think certainly is one um, challenge that's presented. But in, in honest, like we didn't pull the room at the faculty sessions and say, which one do you prefer? I think I'm just really trying to provide you with feedback. Team, was there any other marked feedback that you thought of? I think the the like the things that we highlighted already in terms of the size in, in the realignment and the number of transitions are the two concerns. We heard that steadily through facilities, the fit teams. Um, and there, that was also brought up in, in meeting with teachers. I do think like people see the value of the fifth grade and the, the extended instructional time and the teacher collaboration time and the team time. And that was something that we weren't able to share until we met with the teachers very recently in the last two weeks. Um, and that we, I, we worked with a small team to game out that schedule and make sure that it would work logistically for the five, six building. Um, I do think that was an area of concern that was eased in some ways, making sure that it wasn't the other way around, that sixth grade would mimic a fifth grade elementary schedule. So I think that information was well, well received. Yeah, I mean, clearly option two is a substantial change to how we've done things from day one. Um, you know, and I know we've changed from the junior high school model to the middle school model and I just want to make sure that the decision, the ultimate decision made is representative of the majority of individuals that are going to be impacted in that, that, you know, this, that there's buy-in and this isn't, you know, there's not a feeling that this is being forced upon. It's not as, you know, that, that a decision that's not well received is being forced upon that, that this is something that the collective majority think or agrees is the right way to go, whichever way we go. So. Thank you, Mr. Chantasti. Ms. Bowen. Um. I guess to Mr. Smith's question, I'm in favor of realignment. I think it seems like the least disruptive 
physical plan. Um, also, when I attended East Penn schools, I was shifted to five different buildings and I turned out great. <laughs> um, I guess my only remaining question is um, how you're going to manage the plan for um, special ed if realignment becomes reality. Um, I, I see why you had it placed in both categories. Um, and I understand the concerns about some of those transitions, especially for certain populations, such as autistic support. Um, but part of the personal appeal for me would be those students attending their home schools even earlier than they ordinarily would. Um, and to respond to your question in terms of how would we facilitate or come to a decision, we would rely on, I'm looking to our um, members of our special ed team to work closely with building leaders and stakeholders. So we would want parents of current students to be involved and give us um, like appropriate, like push back and say, like, what about this? Have you thought about that? So that we can arrive at a decision that to Mr. Jankowski's point really does uh, reflect ultimately what's best for students in, um, in really all grade levels, including those who participate in our specialized programs. I think, I mean, I think that parent voice is gonna be critical and we're appropriate student voice. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, Dr. Whitney? Yeah, so in respect to Mr. Smith's request, I respectfully decline to give my views now because quite frankly, I, I and I very much appreciate your acknowledgement that for some of us on this board, this has been a two year discussion process, whereas for others of us, it is now a two week discussion process. And that while this isn't the first day that I've been aware of the options on the table, this is the first comprehensive discussion that I have sat through about these options. So there is a lot to digest and to vote in two weeks. And I understand it's not a vote on every detail of the plan, it's a vote on direction. But even that, or maybe especially that, is a very daunting prospect. So I'll just say that. Um, I mean, if you ask me to give a decision, I'll give my decision, but I want it to be a good decision. <laughs> and I want it to be a, a, a well-informed decision. And you know, if it must be in two weeks, it must be in two weeks, but that feels you know, pretty accelerated given the amount of information to digest here and the implications that are on the table. I'm sorry, I just had one more moment of brilliance here. Um, I, I think we're we're getting very close to a point where the can be the makeup of this board is going to change potentially dramatically. Um, I understand that it feels like a lot of pressure to make a decision in two weeks, but I think it might almost be less wise to push the decision and end up with a brand new board or slightly new composition of board when some of us who may be vacating our seats have at least been around for last year's presentation and some of these last several weeks of discussion. Um, that's not just me trying to wield my last moments of power here. <laughs> no, I, I'd like to just follow up on that point. I think that is going to be, a, a, um, no, I was gonna make that point, that exact point is Bowen. This board has been involved most of the sport has been involved from the beginning of the process, starting with the demographic study and moving forward. And so I think we as a board, as the current board is best equipped to take that information and move forward with a decision on, on direction. Um, and, you know, carrying on to, you know, Mr. Champagne's point, you know, I don't think, you know, in three weeks we're being asked necessarily uh, you know, approve a, a funding level, which is what Ms. Bowen, Bowman was, was concerned about, but more just, you know, as, you know to borrow Mr. Champagne's uh, imagery, you know, put the fork in the road and, and then, uh, you know, take a direction. Uh, so I think the, you know, those, those two things combined, it really does make sense for us to, um, you know, provide direction in, in three weeks um, and, uh, you know, you know, while, while I certainly, you know, appreciate that, that this, you know, for, you know, I'm one of the six that hasn't been involved in all these discussions, every discussion that's been going on here. Um, but at, at the same time, being around it, you know, I think this current board has a responsibility to try and make that decision um, 
and, and in, the, in the best interest of, of, of uh, um, you know, the students and, and our and our staff and our community. Is there anything else? Are you sure? I can go another couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'd just like to thank um, you know the, the the administration and the the all the collaborators on this discussion is very thorough. Uh, tremendous amount of information, certainly, uh, but it was well thought out, well presented. And um, you know, I think as a board, if we do have follow-up questions, we know the administration is more than willing to address them individually. Uh, and then to get to get each of us in a place where we think that you know they need to you know, make the right decision. So again, thank you to everybody involved. Um, I guess those of you that don't have to be there or be here, you, you can certainly leave and, and whatnot. But again, thank you very much. And um, I guess we'll move on to the next thing. <laughs> all, right. all right so moving on um next item on the agenda is personnel um just have to make a make a couple of announcements uh first is that uh, we had an addendum to the personnel agenda that was added to uh, to board docs uh, so that that was uh, something that the public could view ahead of time um and actually that was the only announcement up there so if i can have a motion to uh, to accept the uh, personnel items so moved Second. comments or questions if not uh, ms allen please call the roll Bowman, aye. Mr. Burns, aye. Mr. Champagne, aye. Mr. Fuller, aye. Jen Cassie, aye. Mr. Smith, aye. Dr. Whitney, aye. Mrs. Bowen, aye. Dr. Levinson, aye. aye. Uh, before we move on, I believe Dr. Campbell would like to uh, make some acknowledgments. Yeah, just a few quick comments. In particular, the board just accepted the retirement of several um, critical members of our East Penn team, specifically Ms. Carr, who's an instructional assistant at Emmaus High School. Um, she's been working carefully in our special education department for the past 17 years. Similarly, Mrs. Weslowski um, is an instructional assistant at currently at Shoemaker, but she's been at many elementary buildings in her 22 year career in East Penn. So we will certainly miss her. And finally, Kim Wanish, who is an administrative assistant. She's currently in the Office of Teaching and Learning. Um, she began her career as an administrative assistant at Albertus and then moved to McCungy and has been with our, um, our curriculum team since 2007. And it's really just been um, an incredibly stable force um, and, and great leader within the team um, for the past 29 years that she'll have upon retirement. So we will certainly miss Kim as well as our three retirees. Okay, thank you. And thank you for their service. Uh, next on the agenda is business operations. There's only one item and I have a motion, please. So moved. Second. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Mr. Bird. Aye. Mr. Campaign. Aye. Pelagi. Aye. Mr. Jankowski. Aye. Mr. Smith. Aye. Dr. Whitney. I've seen. Mrs. Bowen. Aye. Ms. Bowman. Aye. Dr. Levinson. Aye. Eight ayes, one MC. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Uh, next on the agenda is curriculum. I'm going to separate these into two separate motions. I'd like to take a motion on A. Uh, first, may I have a motion? So moved. Second. Are there any comments or questions? Seeing none, is anyone call the roll? Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Falahi? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Mrs. Bowen? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Allen. 
I'm going to, uh, if there are no objections, take uh, B, B and C together. Uh, but prior to accepting the motion, I want to make one announcement. Uh, an error was discovered on page 40 of the draft of the program of studies that's under uh, item C. Uh, the description for the special education class entitled Corner Perks was incorrectly listed in the physics course description. Description has been corrected. Um, with that, I'd like to get a motion on ISB and C. So moved. Second. Any comments or questions from the board? See none. Dr. Hawkinson, sorry. Oh, sorry, Dr. I don't know. I don't know. I have my blind spot. I'm over here on the end. Uh, since I was the one who pushed this last time, I just wanted to acknowledge the uh, changes made to the program of studies, in particular the language in the first such and so pages, um, uh, explaining much more thoroughly <laughs> to my eyes uh, and much more clearly uh, all the various programs and uh, graduation requirements, portrait of graduate. All of those things I think are laid out much more clearly. So I really appreciate the time spent uh, to make, to improve that document. Thank you for that, Dr. Whitney. And yes, those suggestions would certainly be a better, robust document. All right, if there are no further comments or questions, uh, Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Mr. Pelegi. Aye. Mr. Jankowski. Aye. Mr. Smith. Aye. Dr. Whitney. Aye. Mrs. Bowen. Aye. Ms. Bowen. Aye. Mr. Bird. Aye. Champagne. Aye. Dr. Robinson. Aye. Aye. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Uh, there are no other items. Uh, two announcements. There was no executive session this evening. Uh, our next regular extended board meeting is on Monday, November 13th at our usual time, 7.30 p.m. Uh, Further business, uh, I'd like to get a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. Any objections? Uh, good evening. Be safe.